All right, I'd like to call this meeting in order, ask us all to stand and take the Pledge of Allegiance. We can I ask Mr. Bateson to lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I do want to take a moment to say this looks like it's going to be a lengthy meeting. Uh, we've got a lot of items on the agenda and a few that are going to take a little bit of time to discuss and I suspect there'll be a certain amount of public comment along with those. Uh, I do want to remind folks now that public comment is not a Q&A session. It is public comment and we'd ask that everybody uh, may keep their comments to two minutes or less and please don't repeat prior comments if you can help yourself. Um, all right, with that, not to delay anything further, let's get things off and running. Uh, we've got some recognition to kick things off. One is recognition for our Public Works Department. It's National Public Works Week and fill a Public Works truck food drive. And Mr. Michelangelo, our Director of Public Works, if you could kind of kick things off, fill us in a little bit. Sure, I'll take out my prop first. Uh, so in lieu of your heavy agenda, I'll be brief, uh, but for the second year in a row, the uh, Fairfield Public Works Department is sponsoring a food drive. So we built these uh, mini orange trucks last year. We have them this week. We have them in all our schools. We have them in Old Town Hall, Independence Hall, our two libraries, Senior Center and the Park Rec on uh, Mill Plain Road. So we're collecting uh, regular canned goods, provisions. Uh, deodorants, toothpaste, the uh, typical things. We're donating them to Connecticut Food Bank and Operation Hope. Last year we collected over a uh, thousand pounds worth of material and delivered them to those two facilities. Uh, in part of Public Works Week, our New England chapter of the American Public Works Association last year had this idea. 50% uh, of the towns in New England participated. I don't know what the rankings are, but I think we did pretty good and we're proud to do it for the second year in a row. And it's, uh, it's a minimal effort and we are uh, able to collect a lot of uh, uh, material for the local families and makes all our guys feel good in doing it. Good. Thank you. Any comments from my board? Joe, will they uh, be along the parade route? Uh, we were not planning to, but we could set it up there too. That's a great idea. Hey, great, Joe. Good job. I saw him everywhere. Good job. Thanks for everything. Yeah, I think we, we're used to Public Works uh, really going overboard above and beyond the call when we have snowstorms and other uh, big weather events. I want to thank you uh, and your team for, for going above and beyond the call on this and taking a look. And I'm, in recognition of that, we do have a proclamation for you uh, that declares um, May 19th through May 25th, 2019 is National Public Works Week. And we'll, we'll hand this to you guys. Sure. We can't all fit in that, right? Sort of like the soapbox derby. Are you a good job? All right, next up, we have recognition, uh, another recognition item uh, for the, let's go to here, my backup notes. Uh, recognition for the Fairfield Girls Ski Team for winning the Connecticut Interscholastic Ski League state title for the seventh straight year. That's amazing. If I could ask, if I could ask the ski team head coach, uh, Gary, uh, Gary, you got to help, help me with your name here. Kira Coney, yes. Just what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tetro, your staff, all our town representatives and selectmen for inviting us here today. What an amazing season we had. The girls' ski team finished the regular season undefeated with a 22-0 record capturing the Connecticut Inter Interscholastic State title for the seventh year in a row. They also won the L Division regular season championship with a record of 10-0. The girls team defeated Staples by 2.3 seconds on their way to this year's state title. Wow. 
This actually is their ninth state title in the last 11 years. I'm very proud of the accomplishments of our girls' ski team again this year in what is a very competitive league in the state. Thank wow. You. All right. Any comments from my colleagues? Seven years in a row is uh, you know, very successful. Uh, keep up the good work. And uh, to the students who uh, won the state title, uh, I always say thank your parents. Thank your parents, especially skiing. It's not, it's not, that's not an easy one. That's, uh, you know, there's a lot of travel to that. Yeah, so, not, uh, not the cheapest sport either. <laughs> right. So uh, to the students who enjoyed, uh, you know, I guess never losing over four years for the seniors uh, and for the freshmen and the sophomores, uh, it's quite a tradition you're going to have and legacy to con continue. Uh, don't let that wear, weigh you down. Um, but uh, we're proud of you. The town of Fairfield's definitely proud of you so thank you thank you Bateson. yeah uh, thanks girls uh, it's, it's an honor to have you here we're all very proud of you and we can't wait to see you again back here next year yep I'm just excited this is uh, this is excellence on a par with the UConn women's basketball team and I'm just extraordinary yeah. <laughs> uh, I just I'm uh, overwhelmed and I, and I want to concur with my colleagues that the entire town is proud of what you've accomplished and because of that we have some certificates for you thank you very much Let's see if we can get these up Elizabeth Craigers, Maddie Crawford, Ellie Daigle, Lila Denny, Leila Farrington, up in the Alps. Jessica Finnerty, <laughs> Michaela Fleming, <Wow. laughs> Samantha Galuzzo, <laughs> Alessandra Graham, <laughs> Michaela King, Emma Lorian. All right. <laughs> Hayden Mattis, Rosie Mayer, <laughs> Ma Mc McMullen, Tracy McEldowney. All right. Robin Mitchell, Emma Montero. Allie Nye, Tess O'Connor, Jessica Riley, Maddie Riley, Sierra Saltz, Emily Zaporza, Catherine Tweedy, Abby Upton. All right. And let's see All right. There we are. All right. Congratulations,
All right, next up, another recognition for the Roger Sherman Elementary School PTA for winning the National Jan Harp Domain Award for exemplary work in the area of diversity and exclusion, inclusion and commitment and dedication to outreach to all families. Is there somebody from Roger Sherman PTA here? Yes, we're all here, we just couldn't get in the door. <laughs> nope. <laughs> If you please come up to the podium and fill us in a little bit. This sounds really intriguing. Thank you. We're very excited. Um, my name is Marnie White, and I'm one of the PTA co-presidents at uh, Sherman Elementary. And I'm joined tonight by Melanie Ross, who is my co-president, um, Alexis Donovan, who is the chair of our diversity committee, um, Kate Guerin, who is our president-elect, and unfortunately our other president-elect, Lindsay Youngs, was not able to join us, and Dr. Banner, of course, our principal, is here. Um, so as you are aware, Sherman recently won an award from the National PTA. Um, it's the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Award. And we are actually still a little bit stunned that we won it, um, but we uh, really appreciate, we're humbled and very excited by this honor. Um, and so uh, I know that Alexis just passed out the grant, or the, the award application that we submitted um, to the National PTA. And that really outlines in detail all of the many initiatives and programs that were either expanded or added this year. Um, and I guess I just wanted to kind of thematically go over what we did, um, which is essentially, it all was very organic. And it began with parents approaching us um, and discussing things like um, wanting to expand our diversity programming. Um, previously, we talked about learning differences and Alexis our chair um, actually sent us emails, the board emails um, last year discussing all of the many different forms of diversity um, that parents really find to be important and would like to have presented and educated to the children. So do you want to say That's a little okay. bit about the, okay. Um, so, um, so our diversity week was expanded to diversity, our diversity, sorry, excuse me, diversity day was expanded to diversity week. And in that week we covered themes um, like gender differences, family composition, racial and ethnic diversity, and learning differences, and then interwoven throughout all of these themes were uh, messages about anti-bullying and kindness and inclusion. Um, we are really happy with the reception. The kids were very excited. Dr. Banner and the entire staff of Sherman were extremely supportive. Um, they supplemented all of the programming. Um, Dr. Banner concluded the week with a town hall and with, that was focused on anti-bullying and kindness. And it was a really positive message that the kids very much enjoyed. And then we also had a, uh, dozens of, of parent volunteers who went into the classrooms to speak with all of these smaller groups about these themes. And it was a really exciting time. There are a whole bunch of other programs, but I don't need to get into all those since you've got them in hand. But we, um, we're really excited and really grateful um, for this recognition, and we're um, pleased to bring it to Fairfield because I think it's a really good feather in all of our collective cap. And it's a wonderful town, and we want more people to know about it. Yep. No, thank you. Any comments from my colleagues? I, I would thank you for all your hard work. I know it's not easy. Uh, it's like one of those moving targets, you know, you got to keep up with. and. Um, you know, putting this together to actually win the award is, is quite impressive. So congratulations to your PTA. Thanks. Dr. Bantner, did you want to? Mr. Yeah. Bateson? I, thank you. The, the topic is timely. Uh, we all appreciate the work you do. And to be nationally recognized, it just, it, it's fantastic. Thanks for all your efforts. Yeah, I, I couldn't be more grateful. One, uh, I think it's important that Fairfield's recognized as being a welcoming community. And, and boy, you stand for that in big time. Second, as somebody who was part of a, um, this is a multi-ethic, um, multi-racial family uh, for a bit. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your efforts on that behalf, especially in our town, especially now when we need that. When I look at everything that's taken place on a national level, all the rhetoric, all the hyperbole, when we look at, we read about events in other towns, I want to thank you for not just reacting to it. You started this a long time ago. This was part of the vision for making that for Fairfield. And I think you're setting a great example for our other schools, but also for our community at large. And we did a conversations in diversity about, um, I want to say, seven or eight years ago in our community to talk about how diverse we are, how welcome we are or not, mm -hmm. and what things we can do to help both educate, understand, and be better at that.
Uh, I'm talking to some folks now about whether we can reinitiate that, but I think what you've done is take a lead step in terms of showing that it can happen in a school. Let's get it and, and get, engage the community in the larger discussion. So just thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you. We really appreciate it. All right. And I think there'll be some further press coming out on this too. I think we've got some press releases planned and all that, I think. So, all right. Yes. Again, yes, thank you very much. Next up, uh, item number six on our agenda is a resignation from the Land Acquisition Commission. Uh, James Pura, Pajura, Pajura, Republican, 1158 Mill Hill Road, term of 1117 to 1121. His resignation date was May 13th, 2019. This is for information only. On appointments, item number seven, to hear, consider, and act upon the following appointments. Uh, I guess we'll take these one at a time. For the Golf Commission, Christine Hogan, Democrat, 48 Thornhill Road, Thornhill Road, term 419 to 424, to fill a vacancy for Eileen Wenzel, whose term expired. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. Uh, any discussion? No, thanks for your willingness to serve. No, thank you, Christine. I had a great uh, conversation with Christine. Is Christine here? Oh, there you are. All right, great. Uh, I, we had a great conversation on the phone. I want to thank you for stepping up and, and being part of this again. Uh, as we say time and again, Fairfield really runs on volunteers and all our boards and commissions and, and their help, and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for being willing to serve. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Congratulations, Christine. You, you still need to do, coordinate with the town clerk on getting sworn in, but if you'd please do that, that would be good. Uh, next up, to hear, consider, and act upon the Land Acquisition Commission, Jill Brown, Democrat, 1112 Holland Hill Road, term 1117 to 1121, and this is to fill a vacancy for James Pajura, who resigned. Um, she's moving from an alternate member to a full member. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. Any comments from the board? And thank you for your willingness to serve. Still here? Don't see, okay. Uh, I had a chance. I'm sorry, Ms. Bateson. Did you? Good. Okay. I had a chance to talk to Jill when she came on as an alternate. I was very impressed with her moving to, moving to this community, want to get active in this community, and, and stepping up to do uh, serve on this commission. So I'm, I'm thrilled to honor her with this, uh, support her with this appointment. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. All in favor say aye. 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 Congratulations, Ms. Brown, and, and also to you out there. Please remember to see the town clerk to get properly sworn in. Next up, uh, from the chief fiscal officer, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the chief fiscal officer. Resolved that pursuant to the authority vested in the Board of Selectmen by section 37-25B of the Code of the Town of Fairfield, the bylaws of the Defined Contribution Retirement Plans Committee are hereby approved and adopted. I have a motion to accept. I'll make a motion. A second. Second. And is Mr. Mayor here? This one's okay. All right. Hopefully that'll be a short trip from the hall into here. He did indicate to me in the hall that this was a great revision. <laughs> Like, um, I was going to give the introduction and then I was going to go into the background and overview of the plan. I can start with the overview of the plan if you want to go with that and then we can get into the introduction of what we plan on doing with the plan. 
I'm going to suggest that it's your presentation and is okay. Uh, hi, so I apologize. I was, didn't realize you were going to get to this point so soon. Uh, so this is for the 401A. Yes. Um, so a little background, just a quick introduction. Uh, got involved with the 401A a couple years ago. The town's had a 457 for like almost 30 years. The 401A was put in place in 2011. Um, when I analyzed it and looked at it, it was a decent plan but the plan could use some, I decided to determine the plan could use some improvements. Uh, Emmett's the, when Emmett came aboard, because the plan is under the auspices of the HR department, when Emmett came aboard, I brought him into my conversation <coughs> and we discussed and went on a process to, uh, to work to improve uh, the 401A 457 plan from both administrative, education, and investment option perspective, uh, perspectives. Uh, we did that. While we were doing that, there became, in the, uh, in the press, there were some 401 401k plans, corporate America that got sued. There was also lawsuits. Uh, the Board of Finance got concerned about that, and so they became interested as well. Um, Um, we've made a presentation to the Board of Finance a couple of months ago, which uh, I don't know, there were some misunderstandings there, um, where we pointed out, kind of was going through what we had done, why we had done it, and the process we went through. The um, Board of Finance questioned the authority of what we did, how we did it, and the result of what we did, and asked for an audit. So we had an audit done as well. So. What we're doing today, I'm doing this mini intro, and then then, so, and, uh, then Emmett's going to go through. Is Emmett in here? Emmett's here. Emmett Hisson, the HR director, is going to go through the process, what we did, a little bit of education, and what we did, um, and the audit with Mr. Uh, George Casper from Pumpa the Conley, who's here. Uh, his firm uh, did the audit. He's here to uh, discuss the audit. And then we'll discuss the bylaws. The town ordinance require, uh, stipulates that the Board of Selectmen is the plan administrator. That means you. Years ago, in 1989 or something, the first selectman at that time designated uh, HR to, to, uh, to, uh, to be the, her designee to be plan administrator. Uh, so that's where it's been reciting since then. Uh, in the audit, uh, Pullman Conley recommended that the bylaws be approved by the first selectman, kind of a redesignation and affirmation of, of, of the appointment and the assignment. And, um, and that's kind of it. Um, oh, subsequent, what we did, uh, just a little bit of the timeline, we went out to bed. Um, we had X number of bidders for record keeper and for fiduciary. That will be explained in Emmett's uh, presentation. S and the last thing we did was we presented to the JRIB, the Joint Retirement Investment Board, uh, what we were doing and what we had done, and explained to them how we lent their involvement because there's a lot of talent in the investment industry with on the JRIB. So uh, they voted to uh, accept uh, the responsibility to oversight uh, the investment fiduciary position and act, the investment fiduciary activity. So with that, we, that was the last piece of the, of the, of the process. We uh, finished up the bylaws and are bringing the bylaws here for your approval. So any questions for me, or should I just turn it right over to Mr. Hibson? Uh, I don't have any at the moment. Why don't you complete, finish, go on with the presentation, we'll see if any come up. Yeah. Mr. Good evening, Emmett Hipson, Director of Human Resources. So as uh, Bob mentioned, we have two plans. We have a defined uh, contribution 401 plan and a 457. 457 plan 
is an employee plan where any employee in the town, any full-time employee in the town can participate. The town does not provide matching funds into the 457. In, in and around 2011, uh, we started implementing a, two th a defined contribution 401A plan for um, to replace our pension, defined benefit pension plan as it related to non-sworn employees. So you have a 457 and a 401 plan that are at issue. Back in 1989, as Bob said, the, uh, the Board of Selectmen voted to make the Human Resources Department the plan administrator, and it's been residing there been residing there since. So the overview, the total town full-time budgeted employees is 458. I'm going with budgeted numbers, just uh, obviously we're filled differently on any given day. Um, the budgeted uh, payroll for fiscal year 19 is 37,085,76. There's 29 different departments. There's seven uh, bargaining units. The DB plan um, has 175 plan participants, excluding police and fire. Current salary basis is 14,310,578. Um, and then the 457, or the 401 plan, excuse me, has 90 plan participants. The current salary basis of 6,048,779. So 401 was created uh, as a successor to the defined benefit pension plan starting in 2011. Currently, as I said before, there's 90 active members in the 401A. Um, that will continue to grow as full time. Um, DB people retire, we replace those positions. So anyone that gets hired that is in a DB plan now that is not police and fire will be replaced with someone going into the DC 401 plan. Um, there's currently about $2,100,000 uh, under asset in the DC uh, 401. ICMA was the previous plan provider and is now the record keeper. Um, October 2018, the plan went to be an open source. So a plan provider is someone who provides you an entire package. So they come in and they have the, they choose the lineup, um, they negotiate the fees, and a record keeper simply is the person who's the administrative handler of the, um, of the data. We actually hired Hooker and Holcomb as the plan advisor, and they now choose the lineup um, and they are the ones that end up getting the fees uh, for us, choosing what fees we're going to pay based off of the lineup that we are, that we're in. The 457 has been in existence for over 30 years. Um, up until recently, we had two plan providers, ICMA and Empower. There's currently 372 members enrolled in the 457B plan. There's approximately 33 million, 264 um, thousand eight hundred and five dollars under management. If you're wondering why the difference um, in enrolled members versus employees, you can remain in the plan after you retire. So we have individuals who have retired or left employment who remain in the plan. So we have, as I said, 372 members enrolled. That's not employees. Uh, as of December 2018, this became a fully open plan um, with Hooker and Holcomb as the plan advisor and ICMA as the record keeper. So I kind of mentioned some terms, the plan sponsor, the town of Fairfield is the plan sponsor. Plan administrator um, has been delegated to the town of Fairfield Human Resources Department. Uh, the plan um, advisor is now Hooker and Holcomb and the record keeper is now ICMA. 401 applicability. Um, department heads went into the plan on November 1, 2015. The employees were the first bargaining unit to go into it via collective bargaining agreement. That was April 1st, 2011. Um, nurses went in on, uh, excuse me, ECC employees were next on July 1st, 2012. Nurses were, uh, Thea was next on April, whew. nurses were next on March 11th, 2013. Thea on April 11th, 2013. And PETA was April 22nd, 2013. Um, I have a chart which, and I'm obviously doing this to the table, so there's, PETA's got 27 uh, DB employees and 12 DC employees. So they're about a third, uh, two thirds to a third in the defined benefit plan. ECC is 11 uh, employees in the defined benefit plan and three in the defined contribution. Thea's uh, 46 in the defined benefit and 35, so they're closer to a 50-50 split. Nurses are 12 in the defined benefit, eight in the defined contribution. DPW has got 52 in the defined benefit and 26 in the defined contribution. And department heads are nine in DB and six in the defined contribution.
The plan provisions, uh, all employees that are eligible for defined contribution 401 must contribute. Um, the way it works is we have a 4% um, minimum requirement and we'll, the town will match up to 5% of base salary. Um, employees can contribute up to the IRS maximum of the plan. However, for a 401A, you must choose your election when you first enter into the plan. So you have to choose that number at the time that you get hired or time that it's eligible to you, and you cannot make changes unless the plan design changes. So your income change does not allow you to alter your contribution percentage to the plan, unlike a 457. So it's a one-time, lifetime decision unless the plan changes are made. Um, employees are immediately vested in their contributions, and then we have a five-year um, cliff vesting. So we're a little different than ERISA. We are not governed by ERISA, um, but we try and follow uh, when applicable. When this plan was set up, kind of follow the defined benefit plan. And so uh, ERISA requires either th um, three-year cliff or five-year schedule. Uh, we are at five-year cliff. Um, that's kind of one place we do vary from um, from ERISA. Are, are you guys clear on cliff versus schedule? Do you understand the concept on that? All right. Uh, 457, um, available to all full-time employees regardless of the bargaining unit. Uh, employees may contribute to the IRS max, which is either uh, 19000 or 25000 depending on age and catch-up provisions. Um, no employer contributions to this plan, except for department heads who get a matching 50% uh, of every dollar up to $1,000 maximum town contribution. So if an employee, if a department head contributes 2,000, the town contributes 1,000 for department heads. Employees are 100% vested at all times. Um, employees may make changes to contributions at any time, as long as the changes do not go above the IRS maximums. Uh, we do allow employees to take one loan against their balances based on the IRS rules, essentially no more than 50% of the vested balance up to $50,000. Uh, the changes we made, an attempt to modernize and improve the plan, um, we added a plan advisor, so like our defined benefit plan where we hire Callan, in this case we hired Hooker and Holcomb, they go out and they do a review and make sure the investment lineup is appropriate. Um, which eliminated then our turnkey provision DC plan that we had and that quite frankly most employers have. Uh, we went from two plan providers for the 457 to one. The 401 always had one uh, plan provider. Um, the process that we used, we created a, uh, a committee. Um, we went out to bid, right? And so we got first level bid, we, uh, we had a committee of uh, myself, um, Bob, the uh, purchasing department benefits manager that reviewed to make sure what um, bidders we felt were compliant or capable of handling the work. Uh, once that was, uh, once we down um, selected to what we felt was uh, people who were qualified bidders. We created a bid review of the Director of Human Resources, the Chief Fiscal Officer, Purchasing Agent, uh, Benefits Manager, Chairman of the Employee Retirement Board, one member representing public safety units, and one member representing general government uh, unions. Um, we interviewed all of the plan advisors. Um, we selected Hooker and Holcomb. It was not unanimous, I'll be honest with you, but it was, there was a vote, I believe it was 4-3 vote to, uh, to go with Hooker and Holcomb. We developed a contract with Hooker and Holcomb. Um, Hooker and Holcomb then did a search for a record keeper. ICMA um, ended up becoming the um, selected record keeper. The issues we were looking for, the relevant factors to be considered for the plan advisor, what we considered were um, minimum required assets under advisement, uh, their willingness to be in educational and training, willingness to be a plan fiduciary, um, willingness to help the town establish an IPS and governance document and cost. Um, for the record keeper, we were looking for education and training, uh, account representative commitment, uh, website presence and access, certified planner, uh, certified financial planner access and cost. And so what, um, what you get with a certified financial planner access, which ICMA has, is they can actually make recommendations as to um, where you should have your accounts as it relates to 
your maybe not specific investments, but they can tell you how you should have it balanced. So if you should have certain, you should be in a um, long a growth fund, or if you should be in just different asset classes, they're allowed to advise you as to your whether your funding is properly set up under your asset classes and recommend that you make changes. They, they obviously don't force you to make changes, but they can talk to you about that. If you have a, if, if you just went with a record keeper that did not have a CFP, you, they would not be able to make um, investment uh, recommendations to the um, employees. And in fact, yesterday ICMA was here with the certified financial planner. Um, people are scheduled time to come in, talk to them, and they go over their specific lineup and can tell them what uh, investments are within individual classifications and why they're chosen, but um, again, won't recommend a specific investment, just a class. Um, that being said, the town, we believe, now has a world-class defined contribution plan, and we're very, uh, we're very proud of what was put in place. Um, it is very low cost for our employees um, and has a very good uh, opportunity for them to invest in, and gain um, retirement solvency. Any questions on the overview? I have a couple. Gentlemen? Um, so IMCA was handling it before? As, as, as one entity before? ICMA was handling the 401 um, individually, and then with the 457, we had two providers. We had ICMA and we had Empower. Was Empower acting as the Hooker and Holcomb? No. no? Empower was a separate plan provider. Okay. So is the adding Hooker and Holcomb now, is that adding an additional layer compared to what we had in the past? It is. Okay. And does that additional layer cost more to the town employees in fees? It does not. And why would that be? Because the town's covering the cost of that. So, so is it a break even for the town or is it a break even for um, the total cost? Like, I, I guess I'm, I'm focusing on fees. Did our fees increase, whether it's the employee or the town, versus just sticking with one by adding that additional layer? So fees probably did not increase overall because the investment cost went down. So we went with a lineup that is much cheaper um, for employees. But we did, since we hired an advisor that was not with the plan before, much like the DB plan, we don't charge employees for the advisor of the DB plan. We have Callan that does that. In this case, Hooker and Holcomb, we felt it was um, appropriate for the town to pay those fees. Did the town get anything in return for paying those fees? There's a less chance of being sued, so our liability goes down significantly. And um, we believe it's an appropriate thing to do for employees and for the town. Uh, was it part of any union negotiation or anything along those lines? It was not. Okay. So it's just an added benefit to the employees? Correct. Okay. And what's the, what's the increase to the town? Um, in the total fees for managing that much money we're paying? $25,000. It's a flat fee of $25,000. Flat fee of $25,000. We got a very good deal. Much cheaper than managing the, the defined benefit plan. Okay. Um, that's all I got right now. Big picture, Emmett. You just mentioned reduce the exposure to the town. In, in what way? So if you were... Um, following anything about defined, contrib defined uh, contribution plans, you would notice or you would find that there were a lot of lawsuits on that. And what happens in a lot of these things, not different than what we had here in uh, Fairfield, is you go out and you hire an ICMA, you hire the Hartford, you hire Mass Mutual, any one company to come in and manage your, your plan. Well, the reality is no one's tracking what fees, what costs, whether the, whether the investments are appropriate investments or not for the fund, um, whether it's actually benefiting the employee or whether it's more benefiting the, um, the company that's actually setting up the plan. So there's a lot of lawsuits out there. There's a lot of, um, hasn't much in the municipal sector, but there's been a lot of lawsuits. Private practice, Yale got hit. I mean, you can, that's probably the most, um, the largest one around here. Education realm has got a huge, um, huge hit right now. Uh, Yale got hit pretty big. So there's a lot of lawsuits out there. That was one of the main reasons why we started this process. 
uh, to begin with. It actually started before I got here, but um, you know, it's not a, it's not a bad thing to do. You, um, other towns have gone and hired advisors specifically for uh, for this reason. Okay, and H and H is known for this. Yeah, H and H is is. What else do they do for us? Are they our actuaries? For the DB plan, they're the actuary. No conflict there. No, that was that was addressed, and they're separate entities, and um, I believe it's a conflict. And when you, you mentioned something before, the lineup is cheaper. When you say the lineup, is that the the investments that the employees can choose from? Yes. So in other words, Vanguard, Willing, all those things. So we're in. Yeah, we have different assets that have lower management fees um, in included in the plan. Okay. I'm good for now. All right. yeah, as Bob said, the streamline too, there's much less um, investment choices in the asset classes. I believe you had, yeah, if you're going to talk, you really have to be at the mic to do this. But I believe you had some other parts of your presentation. I, I, I had the bylaws. I thought uh, Bob no, was going to. No, no. no. no uh, George uh, Casper. So, yeah, so basically what we did was we improved the education, reduced the town's liability. Potential, and um, and developed a world class plan. And one of the issues that came up as the, with the board of finance was: is the, was the right people doing it? Was the process correct? Is the result good? And how do we know? So uh, we ended up uh, calling Pullman Conley and uh, engaging them to perform an audit of the process. And I'm going to introduce uh, Attorney George Casper from Pullman and Conley. Thank you, Bob. Good evening. Uh, I'm George Casper of Pullman and Conley, a member of their employee benefits uh, practice group. And as, as Bob had indicated, once having them gone through that process, uh, I think they, they decided let's, let's take a time out and, and ask us to take a look at the, the process that they went through in, in evaluating the 401A and 457B plans making sure that it was a responsibility of, of HR, finance, and the community that was in place and not somewhere else such as which with the, the, uh, the Joint Retirement Investment Board, JRIB, referred to earlier by Rob. So we looked at uh, the plan, the, the town's code, charter, uh, minutes, uh, policies and procedures that the, the HR department in, in the DC, or what we call the Savings Plan Committee, had put in place uh, for these two plans. Um, we also discussed uh, with uh, members of that committee. I also interviewed uh, consultants with H and H about uh, their role that they've played in the process, um, their responsibilities. I just talked about what what their role is in, in, in overseeing the investments, what their understanding of, of the services agreement is with the town and the like. Um, it's upon our review of the, of the code and the charter it, it is clear that the RTM had intentionally provided for these, these defined contribution savings plans to be separate and apart from the existing retirement systems, the employees' retirement system, police and fire retirement systems that had, that had been in place, um, which were previously established under the, under the code and charter and through collective bargaining agreements. Um, the, that RTM left that with the, the Board of Selectmen. Uh, it was clearly laid out in, in Section 37 of the Code, uh, providing for the Board of Selectmen to have that responsibility of oversight of the, the 401A plan, the 457 plan. Um, and the Code uh, provides for those specific two sections of the Code that address these types of, of savings plans, as well as a 403B or other type of uh, Internal Revenue Code qualified uh, plan. Um, so initially, there was just the 457B plan um, that was assigned by, you know, to the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen uh, delegated oversight for the administration uh, of that plan to human resource personnel, uh, now currently Emmett, as the plan coordinator. Um, Board of Selectmen at that time also delegated to various uh, department heads their respective responsibilities, be it uh, uh, record keeping, uh, tracking eligibility, uh, overseeing investments from the finance department, et cetera. And hence, there was this, the, the committee established. Um, 
where we determined that when the 401A plan was, was implemented some around 2007, the responsibility for oversight again laid with the Board of Selectmen and that was delegated to the, the, the DC Savings Plan Committee. Um, although, although we don't have any, any clear record of that, that's where it, it lies simply by operation of the code as well. It, it couldn't go to, to the, the, either the retirement systems boards or to the Joint Retirement Investment Board because it was clearly laid out in the code as being a, being a separate uh, administration process. Um, the committee uh, then recently as described by, by uh, previously, were shopped around through the process of an RFP uh, for purposes of determining what is the appropriate uh, oversight administration, uh, third party involvement for, for these plans. Um, there was a question I, I think asked about, well, it, you know, is, is there some cost savings there? Uh, and, and I'll address that. I think there was an elimination of, of one of the vendors. Um, by, and, and consolidated uh, the record keeping services all with ICMA. Um, so I expect, again, I, although I don't have the numbers, there, there was likely some savings there. And as, as Emma had indicated, the retention, uh, the engagement of Hoker and Holcomb as the an investment manager, uh, is technically what they are under their services agreement, they take on fiduciary responsibility uh, for the oversight of the plan, the selection of the investment fund lineup that is made available in these two plans uh, for the employee, the participants to select and direct their investments in. Um, and they do that in a, in a fiduciary capacity. Uh, um, they have the discretion to select which funds come in and out and, and the responsibility to monitor those investment funds, the responsibility to, to monitor the investment managers. Uh, again, a very good practice, uh, both on, on the governmental side as well as in the private sector. Um, and and uh, Bob had alluded to many of the lawsuits that uh, have been uh, initiated over the last you know, 20, 20 years that are focused very specifically on fiduciary oversight, fees, and the investment uh, performance of the investment lineup, the, the funds that are offered to the participants. So our evaluation was, we made an evaluation of that process, it determined it was both appropriate and, and proper uh, under the code and the charter. Um, the, the process they, that they went through um, to issue the RFP, uh, as well as to review and select uh, the, the vendors for these plans, uh, we thought would, went through a, a prudent process um, that, that was reasonable uh, and resulted in, in, in a, uh, a selection of, of an appropriate provider, uh, which is Hooker and Holcomb. Um, and again, at Hooker and Holcomb now serving as an investment fiduciary removes from, from the, not only from the committee, but from the Board of Selectmen, that, that fiduciary responsibility and hence you know, the potential risks that, that come with that um, as, as fiduciaries. So that's been essentially delegated out to this uh, Hooker and Holcomb, removing that from, from the town's responsibility. Um, they have very good understanding. It is, is you know, one of the services that they commonly serve. Uh, we work with them or, or have other clients that, that they serve uh, on the, uh, for their plan committees as well in terms of investing either re making recommendations to plan committees on investments or actually doing the actual investment management for 401k plans, 457b plans as they are here. Um, the alternative to that is for the committee or even the Board of Selectmen to retain that responsibility uh, of, of selecting the investments and, and um, you know, we never really recommend that unless there is clear expertise, <laughs> investment expertise, mm -hmm. as well as you know, some expertise with respect to the fees that are, are tied to investments and particularly mutual funds, collective trusts, and annuity contracts and the like. Um, and, and it also keeps that re responsibility and the potential liabilities with that, with the, with the committee or the board of selectmen if that's not done. We find that there's usually also uh, a better performing fund when there is an independent uh, fiduciary advising the plan. And they've taken a further step, which is, is, is become more and more common in the private sector too, is, is allowing uh, the investment advisors to provide investment education uh, to directly to the plan participants on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 
again, helping the, the, the Board of Selectmen and the committee fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities and oversight for the plan. I understand through uh, the, the bylaws there's, there, there's been some uh, arrangement where the Joint Retirement uh, Investment Board will take on responsibility from the, the, the committee uh, to oversee or monitor the performance of Hooker and Holcomb. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that's also an appropriate and prudent uh, step uh, for oversight of the plans. So the, 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 the JRIB is familiar with that process. They're overseeing managers uh, for, the, for the pension plans. And I, I think that's a, that's a responsibility that suits very, fits very well with that, with that committee. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to field them with you, or, or perhaps the, the three of us can, can field questions from you. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the board on this segment of the presentation? I think there's one more to go if I... We, which one do we have now? Next. Yeah, I do. Uh, next up, I think, are the bylaws. Okay, that's what and, I have. And I'm not eliminating, I didn't mean to say eliminate the option to go back and ask questions on any part of this. Yeah. I'm just trying to get us uh, yeah. kind of moving forward. I got, please go right ahead. Just trying to catch up here. Was this in front of the Board of Finance before? No, this is not in the Board of Finance uh, Authority. Uh, we had scheduled with the Board of Finance a uh, an information uh, session. Okay. That, that's where it came up when the questions were asked, and there was some misinformation that uh, a couple of members of the Board of Finance had. I don't really want to get into it unless you want me to. No. But but. Uh, but that's where it came up. Like, uh, do you guys have the responsibility, to have the authority to do this? Um, you know, what's our liability? What are the issues? Did you go through the right process? Right. Uh, that's a, which is why we hired an auditor to come in and, and investigate. You know, do the diligence on, on what we did. In your determination, George, is that the Board of Finance has no role in this? It, it's not clear as to if there's a specific role for the finance committee, uh, but I, I would imagine there, there may be from investment or, or finance aspect of, of the plan, and I think, uh, Bob, well, correct no, me or no, not. And basically, and go ahead. Uh, if, if, are do they serving on the committee? No, the board of the board of finance, the, the legislative, the, the what you researched in the charter uh, and, and in, in, the, and in the ordinance is that it's up to the Board of Selectmen. That's right. And, and then the, and the Board of Selectmen delegated out to appropriate department heads with the services necessary to, to administer and oversee that plan. It, it, there was no specific reference to, to the Finance Committee at that time. Right. But, but he, doesn't mean, he means the Board of Finance. Board of Maybe finance. that's, yeah, Board the Board of Finance was just different, to, you know, or, or the RTM for that matter. So your conclusion is that there's no role for the Board of Finance to play in this matter? Uh, right, none, none specific. If the Board of Selectmen desired to bring them into that process, then we would recommend um, that, that they name, name them as part of, or the, the, the chair, the head of that department, as member of the committee. Okay. Mr. Bateson. Yeah. Just quickly, it seems like this exercise is uh, driven by exposure, or what led us to this part. So the DC committee has always managed the 457, right, Bob? Correct. Okay, and that's somewhere in the 30 millions. Correct. Okay, so it looks like we now, they're gonna retain Hooker and Holcomb, and it looks like the J-Rib is now gonna be inserted to kind of assist the DC committee as kind of like an, it looks like the J-Rib is gonna be some sort of oversight on the DC committee? Correct. Okay, so that's for how the, the J-Rib is gonna work the, into this? For the investment side of it, yes sir. They're also gonna be involved in selecting. Well that's where I want them because that's where the yeah. pool of talent is. Yes. No offense to you guys, but when it comes to finance, those, those things, that's where they are, right? Right. Okay, I'm good for now. Yeah, there, basically there's, we had a plan, there were no bylaws before, really. And you had, uh, we, we had, and there's terms for it, uh, I think it's called a closed source plan, 
whereas the record keeper, getting back to come, one of your comments, Chris, the record keeper actually brought in the investments. And the investment uh, vehicles, the, the funds, whether it's Mass Mutual or whatever, paid the record keeper. So, um, so, so the record keeper was both the administrator and the record keeper. What we did was we separated those functions. So now it's what you call an open source plan where you hire the administrator, which is H&H, &H, and then you, then you bring in a, a, a portfolio of plans, but there's no kickbacks to anybody. There's nobody paying anybody. Uh, well, so Hooker and Holcomb's doing this for 25,000. They're managing $30 million for 25,000 with no kickback. Well, they don't manage is a little different word in this word. If you go to JRIB, but the answer is yes, there's no kickback. To so direct the, Hooker and Holcomb's that. doing yeah. this for 25,000. Correct, totally, absolutely correct. But manage is, is not exactly the same, is, is not the same function here as it is with JRIB. In JRIB, we, we have a group, which, I'm, which I serve on, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, we have, I think, 13 people. And we, we have a Callan, which is kind of like our Hooker and Holcomb. Yeah. Okay, Callan Associates. And we vote on asset allocation, we vote on the vehicles, we actually invest the money. Okay, we make the investment decisions. With the 401A and the 457, what we do is make available a portfolio that encompasses all the reasonable asset classes at a reasonable price that have excellent tracks records, but the individuals are managing their own money. They make their selections. Uh, what we provide is education and, and, a, and, a, and a good plate of portfolio options. All right. So the employee gets the Vanguard at a less number, a negotiated number. Yeah. Our, there's yeah, no our, kickback anymore. To, yeah. No kickback. No kickback. So no it's kickback. a benefit to the employee that there's no kickback. Correct. Okay. Um, uh, it's, oh. Um, uh, Emmett had said earlier that the vote was five to f uh, four to three. Right. Okay. Was that what was the breakdown of that vote? Was it four management, three employees, like a union no. rep? What was the, How did that break down? I'm just curious on that. There was uh, well, when you say management, there's I mean, who's who's the manager? I don't know who cast which votes. Uh, yeah, but basically, I sort of I mean, I can tell you, I'm just, I mean, basically, <laughs> yeah, I the, the not... two finalists was was H and H and Callan. Okay. Okay. And the current chairman of the JRIB wanted Callan. He's familiar with Callan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, Callan was a more expensive. B were not way more expensive. Uh -huh. Way more expensive. B were not local, not easily accessible. C. Uh, did not participate in education. H&H uh, &H actually throws in an extra educational piece for us. Um, All right, that's good. You answered my question. That's f I'm fine with that. Thanks. Any other questions at this point, or should we have them go on with the presentation? I'm good for now. All yeah. right, if you feel yeah, so, free to so, continue. So basically, also, so the, the issues were um, the, the, the net fees that the, that the members were paying were higher than they, they needed to be. The options were all right, but the fees were higher. The in, in answer to another earlier question, the net cost of the plan is, is much less than it used to be um, if you add it together. But the difference is the town is now picking up 25K. It, so essentially, I want to get to the point where I'm confident in my head that the employees of the town of Fairfield have a better deal in front of them. They're paying less fees, and we have the protection uh, of Hooker and Holcomb versus us managing it, and it's only costing us $25,000. Excellently put. Right? Guys? I'm ready to vote. Since, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's exactly what's happening. Before, before this what was, was restructured, the plans were invested in an in asset class of these different mutual funds that the, that the manager was collecting fees from and then sharing some of that with the two different record keepers. Now we're down to one record keeper. There's no fee sharing between the fund manager and the record keeper, and they're at a much lower asset class because of that savings. And then there's just the flat fee paid by the town. There we go. So the other thing that was lacking prior to, to me getting involved in this, that there was no bylaws. Were no bylaws? Anyway. 
Are you going to cover the bylaws? So, so we, so we finalized. So part of our plan was initially was to get this thing set up, get the record keeper, get the fiduciary, and, and then go to the JRIB to get their involvement. So until we got all of that done, we could not finish the bylaws. Okay, because and have a, a final product to bring here. Yeah. So at the last meeting with the JRIB, which was the fourth Wednesday of whatever last month was, April, uh, we made a presentation to JRIB and what we're doing, same, very similar to presentation here. The only difference was uh, we brought in Hook and Holcomb uh, also to present who they were uh, in, in this capacity. And at that meeting, JRIB voted to accept the responsibility uh, to take that on that oversight role. So we folded that into our then draft bylaws and developed the uh, bylaws that are before you today um, that we're asking you to vote on so this can, process can be finalized and, and uh, documented and uh, filed away. So Mr. Hibson will now go through the bylaws. <coughs> So I believe you each have a copy of the uh, bylaws. I'm assuming you don't want me to read it uh, verbatim, a three-page. Uh, I think if you'd summarize uh, the key points so, so we if, have a good grasp and understanding of the document, that would help. So I think a lot of it has actually already been discussed. Um, one, it kind of sets forth the governance of it. It um, is something for the Board of Selectmen to now approve and amends the 1989 um, assignment to solely to the human resources department and then the finance aspect to uh, the CFO. Uh, this creates um, one that we are hiring a um, an ERISA 338 plan advisor, investment manager. So what that is, that's what you were hearing before about fiduciary. So it doesn't mean the town completely eliminates its fiduciary obligation. We have an obligation to manage the uh, investment manager to properly ensure they're doing um, it's doing its its role, but to the extent that we manage it and ask the right questions, then the investment manager assumes the liability for any asset um, for bad choices or what's deemed to be uh, improper choices of investment um, um, investment lineup. So we have offloaded that response, the the liability as it relates to the investment lineup. That's the main thing. Um, with the, with the plan um, advisor, the investment manager. Operations, we kind of create two committees. We have the committee um, that has kind of been in place, which is Director of Human Resources, uh, the CFO, Benefits Manager, and the controller from the town side reviewing it. And then we uh, give JRIB um, a role. So JRIB's role is essentially going to be to oversee the um, investment advisor. And so the way it works now is that the town has always chosen the, um, the plan provider. Um, so now J Ribble Plant will choose the investment uh, advisor <coughs> and then they'll go to the committee. If the committee agrees with that selection, then we bring it to you, the board of selectmen for final approval. If not, the, both the J Rib and the committee will come to you, explain to you their positions, and the board of selectmen would have final decision making authority as to the investment advisor. Um, the, the main reason why this is where it is is we feel that um, our concern, because we do pay for the cost of the investment advisors, we want to make sure that the town uh, is aware of what it's deciding on that. And we do think that's an important part. The town doesn't want to give up. And that's that was one of the things that I felt strong about. Um, why the committee should remain involved is because we do have town's assets involved in this process. Um, so the duties and responsibilities, the committee um, has overall responsibility from an administrative perspective. The um, JRIB has responsibility from a fiduciary responsibility as it relates to the investment advisor um, and that we're we choose to have a what's called a discretionary advisor selection um, which is a 338 and it's a five-year plan to go with the five-year terms unless such time as uh, either party the committee or the JRIB feels that uh, there's a need in which case the, the parties will meet and discuss and um, make a determination as to whether to go out to bid sooner that's the main terms of it there's identification language there's liability language um, but really those are the main main thrust of the of the bylaws. Any questions from the board? 
I did, yeah. Uh, George, did you review this, uh, the bylaws? I, I have not until today. Okay. Uh, and I, and I, I've provided them with, with some comments. Uh, I think they're, they're, they're workable. Uh, and it does provide for an annual review and consideration by, by the committee for, for future changes. So it should be, uh, you know, kind of a living, breathing document, as you will, uh, going forward. Do, so do you have recommendations today that we should put in as our council on this? One specifically uh, w with respect to the, the uh, limitation on liability and indemnification that I would change the, the standards that are referred to in those two provisions, six and seven on the, on the third page that refer to uh, you know, fraudulent or, or bad faith type behavior to uh, willful misconduct and gross negligence. So is there, okay. Um, yeah, all right, so that's what I call a domino in the government world. Now, Emmett, would, would your committee have to approve any changes the board would make, even if it's minor in, those, in, that, in that nature? I'm not sure I followed the question. So would the committee, which... As it relates to the recommendation George just made. No. I don't believe, I mean, that's the, the, really the bylaws come to you. So the, it's the, you, you're, you're adopting the bylaws that would then. So I'm saying, was there a preliminary group which put this together? Uh, and, so, and yeah, I mean, we, three or four everything? of us took a stab at it. So I think um, I started it, I floated it around to um, Tucker and Holcomb for their council to look at it. I floated it to, uh, to Bob to look at, and then, um, not sure if anyone else took a look at it, but I know the three of us did, and then Bob floated it to uh, to George. Well, should J Rib look at it, being the fact that they're they're part of this? I, I mean, the, 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 by, the bylaws are <coughs> your document. It, it's your document. The bylaws, the, the draft bylaws before the inclusion of J Rib were shared with JRIB. The change in the bylaws from what they've seen is just their, their inclusion. Um, the, uh, the, the bylaws were written uh, internally. Um, they've been a, a living, it's been a living document since October when we finished uh, bringing in uh, Hooker and Holcomb. Is that October? I think it's October. No, we brought Hooker and Holcomb in last night. They've been in for a year. Well, We've been doing this for a year? No. No. no we went through the process. No, we went through the, the process of record keeping search. And and yeah, yeah, when we got, when, when we went, when we, so after we got the record keeper search and everything. So, um, so how long has Hooker and Hope been, been, been doing, doing this? Williams <coughs> went active in, in October, October, November. October, October. For the, yeah. the ICMA switchover went active in October. It would be helpful if you'd step up closer to the mic, please. I'm sorry, the ICMA, the ICMA trans, transition went active in October, hmm. and the Empower uh, switchover went active in December. So the ICMA obviously easier. ICMA had the assets in place so they could implement the changes pretty much, uh, you know, on the spot. And then Empower required um, a lot of um, administrative. So are we getting this document after the fact? Like hypothetically, if we were to vote no on this, if you were to vote no on it, I would assume what would have in place is you have the town, the human resources department as the administrator, based on the board of selectmen's 1989 um, delegation. So right now, the way it stands is human resources has been delegated by this body as the plan administrator. We're coming to you with what we believe is a, you know, much more significant document that provides a lot more people involved in the in the decision making process gives J Rib a role, it gives the CFO a role. Um, it doesn't if you voted no, you would essentially be leaving it in the human resources department and a decision that was made back in nineteen eighty nine by um, but, I forget her name, but the first she's got a building named after her, Dr. First Peach. Selectman Durrell. First Selectman Durrell. So Well didn't we hear from George earlier that the Board of Selectmen would be the the board to approve this? Right, that's why we're here. Yes. Yeah, but we wouldn't have to approve any changes you made last year. 
No, no, you, you have designated HR oh, to yeah. be your delegee. Not you personally, but the Board of Selectmen has. Okay. So we run the thing. What we're trying to do now is codify everything. Right. Right. Or, so there, there were no bylaws. Yeah. So we want you to know what you're doing, what you're responsible for. So we put together this document um, which replaces what was, not, what was absent. Okay. There's nothing there. Right. So I guess is what I'm saying is hypothetically, should have this document come before we went out to bed and do the RFP and all that stuff so that we had, you know, you had a roadmap? Uh, could we have done that? Sure, we could have. Okay. We didn't. All right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. So I guess my statement is this is after the fact is also accurate. It's, it's now. It's, I, 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 yes, I understand that. I mean, I think the point is theoretically the bylaws should have put in place in 1989. I, I totally agree, yeah. yeah. I, so basically, we've been operating on the same... Filling a vacuum. They, they didn't have bylaws, or, and the lack of bylaws, lack of guidelines, let them operate with their own best you know, judgment. Uh, this puts out a formal process in place. I, I understand. Also, earlier, uh, when the question was asked of uh, Mr. Casper about the Board of Finance, I looked around the room. I didn't see Stanton, but I see Stanton's has joined the room now, so I'd like he can respond to that question, I think, regarding uh, exclusivity of, uh, uh, of responsibility. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the, quest, the question was... Afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Stan, if you could introduce yourself. My name's Stanton Lesser. I'm the town attorney. Thank you, Stan. The, the question was asked is, uh, do the, does the ordinance or the chart in any way indicate that the Board of Finance has any authority or responsibility or uh, with respect to the 419 of the 457? So uh, the savings plans are authorized by in Chapter 37 of our town code. And under, I think, 3725B, it provides that the Board of Selectmen is the exclusive authority for all matters of uh, administration, operation, oversight, and management over this, over the plan. And just just to follow up on what Emmett said a minute ago, I think you have two documents in play here. The first is the code, which authorizes this body to run this plan. The second is our charter, which authorizes this body to form committees. So what you're doing by voting on these bylaws is you're, in essence, establishing a committee, delegating to them, which you have the authority to do, the power to oversee this plan. But the ultimate oversight still resides with this. Thank you. Any further questions? Yeah, one follow-up to George. I, it seems like I've heard from every aspect in this. Can you just go back and check the town code and make sure that what the duties and responsibilities we're assigning to the JRIB, they are allowed, is permissible? Because I know there's some language in there. There might be some restrictive language in the town code. I'm ready to vote today, but if you could just take a look at that. I think the town code is fine on that. But just, I want to make sure that what we're delegating to the JRIB, they are allowed to do. Yeah, I, I, believe, I believe you're, you're correct. Right. I will look at that and give you a confirmation. Yeah, just to, to set up a process, uh, if we're comfortable voting on this today, this is the authority of this board. So if we were to get new information, we could take this up at our next meeting. Exactly. But I'm, I'm assuming, I don't think there is, but I'm no, just it's, it's a reasonable question, reasonable place to look. I just wanted to set up a process for if something comes up in that review that this board can go back and, and make the change and it's literally just this board so it could be a, as simple as a one meeting review and change. Any further questions from this board? All right. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Um, Sheila, we do have a first and second on this, right? It seems like it's been a while. Yeah. We do? All right, good. Then... Um, Did we want to do that, George's recommendation? If you'd like to make an amendment, please. This would be the time. Um, okay, so I didn't write it down. <laughs> I think George suggested that removing the acts fraudulently and in bad faith in the latter part of... Uh, 6A, mm -hmm. and have that replaced with willful misconduct and gross negligence. Perfect. I'll second that. And uh, 
is George still here? Yeah, that's it, correct. Is that, we replaced the right words? That's correct. Uh, that was the only place they found acts fraudulently and in bad faith. In seven as well. Uh, there we are. It, it, you know, section seven, A, six A, and seven A. So Chris, did you also mean to correct it there? Let's do it both, yes. Yes, yes you do. All right, and Ed, that's okay with your second? Yeah, second it. All right, any further comment on the amendment and the amendment only? Any comment from the public on the amendment and the amendment only? Seeing none, back to the board, are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 The item as amended is before us. Any further comment? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, thank you, and uh, thank you for the presentation. All right, next up, item nine from the Director of Public Works. This requires Town Plan and Zoning Commission review and RTM approval to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Director of Public Works. Resolve that for the consideration of the sum of $6,625, the town grant to the state of Connecticut a perpetual easement over property owned by the town at the corner of US Route 1, also known as the Boston Post Road, and at Route 135, also known as North Benson Road. Said easement uh, being shown and designated on a map entitled Compilation Plan Town of Fairfield Map Showing Easement Required from the Town of Fairfield by the State of Connecticut Department of Transportation, US 1, Boston Post Road at Route 135, North Benson Road, and South Benson Road. Scale equals one inch to 20 feet, dated November 2018, made by Mark D. Rolf, PE. And further resolved that the first selectman be here be and hereby is authorized to execute on the town of uh, such documents as may be necessary to effectuate this resolution. May I have a uh, motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. All right, is somebody going to present this? Mr. Hurley. Hi, uh, this, this is uh, William Hurley. Uh, I'm the engineering manager for the town of Fairfield. Um, on that huge map that you just described, I don't know if you had it to scale. I have one here. If you... No desire. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just go as quick as I can for this. Uh, the 325 uh, square foot uh, easement is required for the state DOT uh, construction of ADA ramp and a portion of new sidewalk, pedestrian signal equipment, um, signal handholds. Uh, half the easement is already occupied with uh, current sidewalk and uh, signal structures. Uh, the state is upgrading this traffic uh, control signal. Uh, it will have um, new countdown pedestrian indications. It will have audio or non-visual cues for the blind or low vision uh, pedestrians. The, as mentioned before, the ADA ramps uh, will be installed at all four corners of the intersection. And when the push buttons are activated, there'd be an exclusive ped phase allowing the pedestrians to cross while all the other traffic has a red light. Um, the other thing that uh, we were able to uh, convince the state on is to uh, add some additional pavement markings towards the railroad underpass. So um, I can go into more detail, but if you want, I think that's good enough. Uh, right. Any questions question. from the board? Uh, you know, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I know that we're having more and more walkers. We're promoting walking and riding bikes throughout the town. Uh, I think the stoplight at that intersection is important, especially when you think about the fact that we're trying to encourage our, you know, Fairfield U students to to get downtown to utilize our shops for our business owners. I know it's uh, an aggressive approach by the Chamber of Commerce. So I would encourage you to follow up on this with, uh, you know, looking into the Round Hill Road uh, intersection as well. And Route One for maybe a future, a future DOT uh, widening of the crosswalk. Okay. The, the, the key um, or the primary function of this is to replace the stoplight. That's and correct. Because of this, um, literally the structure they're using to support the stoplight in the middle of the street, they need our land in order to provide a foundation or base for that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Any further questions, Mr. Bateson? I'm just happy they're paying for it. <laughs> and doing the work. <laughs> all right. Uh, any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. All in favor say aye. 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 
All right. Thank you, right. Mr. Hurley. Thank you. Item number 10. To hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Town Plan and Zoning Commission. Resolved that the town accept from 11 Harbor Road, LLC, the donation of a portion of real property known as 1101 Harbor Road, Southport, Connecticut, owned by said 1100 Harbor Road, LLC, shown as parcel to be deeded to the town of Fairfield on that certain map entitled Data Accumulation Plan showing parcel to be deeded to the town of Fairfield prepared for 1100 Harbor Road, LLC, 1101 Harbor Road, Southport, Connecticut, scale one inch to 10 feet, dated March 19th, 2019, prepared by the Huntington Company, LLC, and further resolved the town relinquish an easement granted to the town by Robert G. Lee and Jean D. Lee as more particularly described in a certain agreement between the town of Fairfield and Robert G. Lee and G. Lee dated January 6, 1995 and recorded in the volume 1452 at page 221 of the land records of the town of Fairfield. However, said relinquishment shall not relieve the grantors of said easement of any of the other obligations or restrictions set forth in that agreement. Further resolved, that the first selectman be and hereby is authorized to execute on behalf of the town such documents as may be necessary to effectuate this resolution. May I have a motion to accept? Make a motion. A second? Second. Thank you. Any uh, presentation? Good afternoon again. Stanton Lesser, town attorney. I'm just going to get this started and then I'm going to turn it over to attorney John Fallon who can give a more detailed presentation and I think he's got folks here who can better answer your questions than I. Uh, this project has been in the works for quite a while and it started with some issues involving the beach at this address and I think a lot of people who were using the beach coming off of town-owned property did not realize that it was private property um, and some issues developed so we uh, got together with the property owner who ultimately offered to donate the beach portion of his property to the town and to do some other things as well. And uh, before I turn it over to Attorney Fallon for a more detailed explanation, I would also point out that this project requires an 8-24 review from the TPZ because we are acquiring it and it will then go to the RTM. But that review has already been accomplished because uh, Mr. McMahon, the property owner, uh, in order to modify his property, had to get coastal area management approval from TPZ, which he has done, and at the same time they decided to do the 8-24 review just to save some time. So I'll turn it over to Attorney Fallon, who I think can explain it better and answer questions. Thank you, Stan. Uh, members of the board, good afternoon. Good evening, I guess, is the better thing to say. I'm John Fallon. I'm here tonight uh, representing uh, the property owner, Mr. Brian McMahon, who's seated right over there. Also with me is Chris Seggers who, from RACE, uh, who prepared a lot of the documentation that you have, and he'll be making a brief presentation also. Basically, as Stan says, what this is really about <clears throat> is that we have currently an easement that was deeded by the Lees in 1995, as shown on the maps that you have. And that exists over the, the Harbor Road parcel we're talking about, 1101 Harbor Road. It's about eight feet wide, and it was designed to provide public access space um, beyond the limits of private property. The easement, however, if you've been out on the property, as many of you have, uh, is not well suited for its intended purpose. Access uh, is mostly located in an area of a, a substantial existing stone revetment and it's not easily transferable uh, to, uh, to, to, tra to transverse, I should say, and indeed is dangerous to attempt to do so. So what's happened over the course of time and what led to the conversation that Stan alluded to is people seeking access to the beach have been doing one of two things. Either they've been trying to traverse over the easement area and the stones in the revetment, uh, causing serious potential issues of liability, or to avoid that, they have been trespassing over the private property of Mr. McMahon. When we first started to deal with this, I was very, very impressed with Brian's approach, because what he didn't want to do 
is be unneighborly. He did not want to be uh, contrary to what his beliefs are as far as what makes Southport special. He didn't wish to restrict access as he had the legal right to do over his private property or curtail the enjoyment of those interested in using the beach, but he needed to do something because the ongoing problems associated with the trespass onto his private property were causing so much trouble. He was, for example, having trouble renewing his homeowner's prop, um, uh, insurance. So what we came up with, and I, I want to again commend, uh, commend uh, Brian Carey has been great help to us, um, Stanton as well, um, Jim Went, who's here as well tonight. We came up with an approach where Mr. McMahon would make a very substantial gift of waterfront property to the town of Fairfield so that the public access uh, that was always intended could be improved and made safe and legal while at the same time uh, resolve his problem with regard to the trespass that was plaguing his property. You get in my business a lot of people saying this is a win-win situation, but this is as much of a win-win situation as I have ever witnessed. The project is designed uh, to improve public access to the beach and the shorefront for all residents through a gift by Mr. and Mrs. McMahon of very substantial land, private land, uh, that will then become public. It's going to allow residents utilizing uh, and enjoying both the Lower Wharf Park and, and better safe access, meaningful access to the beach as was originally intended. I think it's absolutely consistent uh, with the uh, management plan uh, for Southport Harbor. Uh, in addition, this plan has been extremely uh, fully vetted. Uh, the, the, we've, we've had this reviewed by the DEEP. We had a site meeting at the property with John Goucher from the DEEP. Mr. Went attended as well. Uh, they issued a, a, a positive uh, report to the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's been approved by the Harbor Management Commission. I want to commend Mr. Harmon, its chairman, who spent a lot of time working on this. Uh, it's uh, had a lot of work and approval from the conservation director. And uh, in fact, it was approved, as pointed out uh, by Stanton, by the Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously a few weeks ago. So we have a CAM approval in place that will allow us to affect these improvements as soon as possible. I also want to uh, thank the representatives of Sasquanog. Uh, they've also spent a good deal of time and, and effort uh, working with us. Mr. McMahon, I must say, self-servingly to my client, has been extremely uh, active in terms of outreach to the, the, the neighborhood and the, and the community. And in return, Sasquanog has been very generous with their time and constructive efforts to work with us with regard to this matter. We appreciate very much their support of the proposal. You did receive a letter dated uh, May 21, 2019 from Mr. Imes on behalf of Sasquatch. I'd want to state for the record, on the first page of that letter, they uh, indicate, and I quote, that the proposed new reinforced seawall meets Mr. McMahon's written representation to us and the community, specifically that, and they ask that these things be made conditions of approval. Uh, I won't read them to you, but I will state for the record that all four of those items, as referenced in that letter, uh, Mr. McMahon is totally comfortable with. They should be conditions of approval. I think they're also very consistent with the CAM approval that, of course, will also be applicable here in ensuring that what has been approved is done very, very explicitly and specifically in accordance with the plans that were submitted. And as the Sasquatch said with, at the very end of their letter, with those conditions met, Mr. McMahon will be making a generous and important donation of property to the town, which should inure, ensure public access to this small but wonderful strip of waterfront and the water beyond for generations to come. So I couldn't think of a better preliminary summary of my remarks than <clears throat> quoting that letter from Sasquanog. What I'd like to do briefly at this point is have Chris Eggers, our project engineer, come up. He'll just give you a little more of the meat and potato overview, the specifics of what this is. He'll point out the area uh, of the really non-operational easement to be abandoned. abandoned. He'll talk about the um, area that we're donating to the town and also the other improvements we're making to ensure that it will be well integrated to the lower wolf park. Chris. 
Okay, um, thank you. My name is Chris Eggers with Race Coastal Engineering, uh, Project Engineering Project uh, Manager, working on uh, this project. And um, we'll go through some pictures and the plans that have been submitted and um, go through what the existing site is, highlight some of the problems and the solution, and um, talk about the proposed conditions. <clears throat> so this uh, drawing here is the uh, referenced uh, survey with the new lot line. And this is um, as a, approved by, uh, it was previously submitted to the Zoning uh, Commission and it has been updated to revise the property line up here at this end to uh, <clears throat> bring it more landward. And um, originally in the zone application there were stairs proposed and uh, those have also been eliminated. plan here shows the existing site. This is the easement here. It's eight feet wide off of the lower wharf. Uh, so the lower wharf here fully open to the public. Um, this part here is privately owned by 1100 Harbor Road LLC. <clears throat> and the property line on the south is the Mean High Water Line. Um, so that's established by uh, the Mill River. And there's a natural footpath about here coming off the lower wharf onto the uh, easement, but then also people would naturally continue onto this beach area here. Um, <clears throat> so the pictures on the side kind of illustrate the problem with the easement. It's only eight feet wide. That's all covered in that larger stone, which is hard to walk on. <clears throat> and um, the stone does predate, predate the easement, so it was a legacy issue but it's been carried through. <clears throat> so right here we have a lot of pictures of the existing site. Um, you see over here, there's the white picket fence that's gonna be removed. Uh, the easement is essentially between the stone wall and the fence um, goes out over to the lawn area, the lawn ends, and then you get to the town seawall and the revetment. Uh, and this would be the natural area where people tend to walk through there. And so what we did per the um, zoning conditions on our uh, plan submittal was uh, we reviewed where the um, access would be and where the wall would be. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more detail about the wall in a second, but um, essentially the property line is going to be made about here. So this part here is the lower wharf town property. There's the existing uh, seawall, the existing revetment. Uh, there's stone here, but a lot of sand on top of it. And <clears> there's <throat> that natural footpath. And then this will be essentially the new property line right about here. Um, that was, we went out here and marked up, looked in the field, and uh, finalized the plans based on the field here, but, uh, inclu including all this uh, natural pathways into it. Um, so then all this beach here uh, would become town property, and the upper part would become, uh, would remain with the McMahons as uh, their private property, which it already is. So this is the proposed plan. Um, so we have the revetment here, we have the beach area, we have the lawn. The plan is to put in a seawall behind the revetment here. Um, and this is that pathway area, so people can still walk down there. Uh, as far as the seawall, it's gonna match the top of the wall here, will match the top of the existing wall here. So it'll be um, at the ground level and all, all the, uh, the stem of the wall will be underneath the existing stone revetment. And then the lawn area here will be um, improved. The top of this stone, which is relatively flat, will be uh, covered up in lawn. And then the wall is going to serve to uh, 
you know, better protect the property, better delineate the property, and um, clean up some of the stone so it looks better. And just, uh, <clears throat> going back to the uh, photos here. <clears throat> so the, um, right, so this area here is used on the lawn. These platter stones are covered with new lawn. This pathway will be over here, and we'll have the, uh, the new wall, which will be no higher than the, uh, the lawn is now, so you won't be able to see it. Um, and I did bring along two pictures of some other jobs we did. So there's a revetment here and a lawn, and then there's a wall under the revetment. But it's at the um, lawn level, so that's essentially what the wall proposal would be. And this is the cross section that was uh, submitted to the uh, zoning board. So we have our walls all underground here, top of the lawn comes out. The stone gets temporarily moved um, within a certain limit to allow construction of the concrete and gets placed back, covering the front of the wall, the lawn covering the back of the wall. <clears throat> and um, we've also, the Mans have also engaged uh, landscape architects at uh, Southport Design Studios to resolve the uh, what the plantings will be, and uh, when the timber fence gets removed to uh, finalize the final planting and um, edge delineation along the new property line. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. I think it's uh, you can leave that one up, Chris. Okay. I, was gonna just comment. I think it's important for me to emphasize that this not only a conceptual project, but the actual physical project, the construction of the wall, was what you know consisted of the CAM application that was the subject of public hearing before the Planning and Zoning Commission. And as you can see, and as I think you may even have, you know, very substantial signed and sealed plans were submitted, uh, scaled to elevation, standard construction detail. So I just wanted to emphasize on that point that, you know, th th these plans are both in terms of the win-win concept, wonderful, but thanks to the hard work of the Planning and Zoning Commission, there's a very specific um, set of plans that will form the basis of the zoning permit that will need to be complied with. So, you know, all I, all I would have to say in conclusion without being too redundant is faced with what he was faced with, and I don't want to turn this into a testimonial for Mr. McMahon, but I, I think he has due some credit. Most property owners I know would have simply protected their property and said, you want to use that easement, go ahead, use that easement. And thereby frustrated a lot of people who have come to enjoy the unique aesthetic and, and other charms of this area of Southport. So at significant time and cost to himself, race, me, everybody else, this plan evolved with a lot of help from a lot of people I mentioned before on the town side. But at the end of the day, it is an absolute, using the term again, win-win situation. You now have combined with the Lower Wharf Park a substantial what will become public beach that was private property and access uh, to the resources of the harbor that before, in terms of the easement that was uh, imposed with all good faith and I'm sure with best intentions in 1995, was basically ineffective and inoperable and indeed dangerous. So everyone comes out a winner on this. Um, the McMahons are pleased that the matter could be resolved in a way that it benefits the town, protects their reasonable privacy and property expectations, and the town gets a wonderful addition of, of property uh, adjacent to a wonderful piece of property it already owns, and the people of Fairfield, and specifically the village of Southport, get a much enhanced opportunity for access uh, to the, the coastal resources. So 
we'd be plan pleased to answer any questions you or the members of the public might have, but we hope you'll favorably consider and act on <clears throat> this uh, resolution so we can move forward to the RTM. All right, thank you. Any questions from the board? Mr. Timmy. I have a couple comments here. One, I want to thank Mr. McMahon for uh, putting this together. This is, this is the m most thorough package I've ever received uh, as a member of the Board of Selectmen for someone who's willing to donate, donate land. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, Chris, good job putting that together. Race, you doing a good job with the um, design of uh, the marina as well. So, Race. Devin Santa, by the way, was yeah. here before, but he had an obligation he had to leave, so he was very much involved in this as well. So, the, I mean, this is a very thorough, thorough thing. I, I think, I think I agree with you, Attorney Fallon. It is a win-win. Um, one thing I did want to address because I, I did read the letter yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, in the back half of the uh, letter from the Sasquatch Group mm -hmm. was was w one concern they had. Yes. Uh, you and I talked about that. I would just like you to uh, briefly address the concern. Um, they had. Yeah, this is with regard to I think we, we the matter of referencing more complete plans. Yeah, something. almost like an architectural design or a 3D rendering of what the end result would would yeah. look like. Yeah, I mean, what I would say respectfully, and again, my comments to Sasquatch uh, were stated at the beginning. We we very much appreciate their support and the time and effort they spend making this happen. Respectfully, I would say, however that I don't think that's time well spent. The, 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 I have found doing this for 40 years that the, the most misleading and often criticized element that zoning lawyers love to use is the rendering. Mm -hmm. And how many times zoning commissions say, well, that's not really what it looks like or that's not what's going to be. The renderings can be beautiful, but they are not um, informationally instructive. What is important and what your planning and zoning commission and your staff are meticulous about requiring is detailed architectural plans of whatever structures are going to be built, which include not only elevations, not only building materials, not over manners of constructions, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think there's much to be gained. I think the, the plans, and that's why, frankly, I emphasized when I got back up here and left this board up here, uh, this isn't a situation where we have a wonderful concept, but now we've got to talk about the details. This is a situation where we have a wonderful concept, but the details have been nailed down with plans that have been thoroughly vetted by the DEP and, and the Planning and Zoning Commission. And they will form uh, the linchpin for assurance that what was approved will be exactly what is constructed. So I, I would, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that and uh, again, um, thank Mr. McMahon. You know, the Sasquatch Group has done a fantastic job. I always trip on that name too, by the way. But um, they've done a fantastic job in the neighborhood and in Southport, um, you know, delivering a new park. And they're very engaged in that. And, and you coming to the table and um, being willing to address all their concerns ahead of time before it gets here, you know, leaves that one, you know, I not dotted or T not crossed. And, and I agree with Attorney Fallon. Uh, the drawings there speak for themselves. And, and I, I I'm, I'm okay with moving this the, forward. The one, as a, the one other thing I should have mentioned that Mr. Lesser mentioned, and I think Mr. Went mentioned it to him, is in addition to what I said, an as-built survey, an as-built set of plans will have to be submitted to the town once this is constructed before they'll sign off on it. And Mr. Went, who is here, and his staff will ensure that what is built in terms of location, elevation, Everything else is specifically in compliance with these plans that were approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. That's all I Thank you. Mr. Bateson? Quick thing, John, can you, uh, on the best map you have here, can you uh, uh, show me where the mean high tide line is on the land that we will be getting? I could, but since we're, we got the expert, I'm going to have him do that for us. It's on this drawing and it's on the survey. What's elevation 3.2 contour? So it's this line here. Um, so it kind of comes up high onto the rock here, comes across the beach. This is a rock ledge with uh, tidal wetlands. Can you show me that on the proposed land we're receiving? And maybe use the survey too, Chris. I think it's shown. Yeah, it's, it's, del it's delineated on the survey. There you go. So here's mean high water. Gotcha. That's what I was looking for. Yep. Thank you. All right. Any other questions at this time? No. no. 
board? Uh, just one question, uh, Mr. Fallon, I believe you referenced a letter from Sasquanog uh, that had four conditions and you said you were going to include those. Yes. Uh, I th uh, you referenced it might be in our packet. I seem to have a little trouble locating it. Do you have a copy of that? I do. It's a letter that's dated to the Board of Selectmen. Yep. Can uh, we get... Yes. I is there a copy of that perhaps we could have? Yes. I, 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 there it is. Thank you. It's okay. Just one each for the board at the moment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, and and Mr. Fallon, just to be clear, yes, there are items number pretty basic, right? One, two, three, and four on here, and you're saying one A through one A through A D. Yeah, and then there's an item two, an item three, and an item four. Well, which, which ones were you referring one to, a, just to be clear? 1A, B, C, and D. Those are all uh, which we recommend the board be conditions of any approval, and, and, and number 1A through D we're fine with. I already addressed uh, number 2, mm -hmm. um, and we're also in concurrence with 3 and 4. Okay. So the only one that we would respectfully based upon my remarks to Mr. Timniak's inquiry a minute ago, say we really think is not warranted or necessary is number two. But All we're right. fine with one A through D and three and four. All right. Thank you. Okay, so that's that. All right, then if, uh, okay to go to the public? Yes. Gentlemen? All right, uh, if there are any comments from the public, just yes, raise your hand. Please come up. And I just want to point out, as I did earlier in the meeting, that this is public comment as opposed to Q and A. And and we'd ask you to keep your comments under two minutes. And if there's any other people coming up, we'd ask that you try to cover new ground as opposed to recovering the same ground in comments. But please introduce yourself, give your uh, name and address, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dale McIver. I live at 187 Westway in Southport, and. Um, I'm here to uh, speak for Jack Imes, who is on business out of town, and also I'm part of a three-person team that has spent most of the time interacting with uh, Mr. McMahon. Others certainly have as well, and that would be Jeremy Frost, who is here tonight, a former chairman of the Conservancy, and Mr. Imes himself, who is president of the Sasquanog. Myself, I'm a former president of the Sasquanog. And I'd like to thank Mr. Fallon for allowing me to tear up about two or three pages of comments. Um, you'll probably appreciate this going faster, too. Um, so I think, um, having said what he said about saying the items that he accepts as perhaps being conditions of any approval he might grant is very, very constructive. Um, I'd just like to take one half of a minute to say Sasquanog, as I think was referenced just a minute ago, uh, led the effort to acquire this lower wharf back in 1999, 20, 20 years ago, which solved a, a, a legal dispute between Mr. Lee and the town over who owned that property. No, I'm sorry, a, a, a dispute between the neighbors and Mr. Christian Trevs that extended 22 years before that. So this all started about 42 years ago. The, the lower wharf is a, a tremendous resource. It has put it been, had put in place by the Sasquanog deed restrictions that say no structures, it will be managed by the Harbor Management Commission, and we think that this adjacent property should have the similar restrictions, which is part of those items one through four, uh, and it becomes a natural extension of that. I believe Mr. Fallon uh, represented the story of, of why this came about in terms of the issues at hand. Starting in 2017, you may recall we came to your office with this very plan, the first version of it that said, let's solve this problem with the land swap. We had um, uh, town attorney Lesser and Mr. Harmon and a bunch of other people, and we talked about doing this. Two years later, it is now coming to fruition. We think it's a terrific idea because we started it all with that thought. Uh, we're glad to see that it's coming about. Um, so all happiness and so forth, except I think there's one point, a very important point that needs to be cleared up here, and I hope it's not contentious, but uh, I do want to be very clear about what um, item number two 
is really speaking to that was sort of addressed perhaps by the comments, but not really the concerns that we have. The rendering or whatever that dialogue was is not what we're pushing for at all. Uh, we're, not, we're not concerned about that. That was part of the sort of the back and forth with Mr. McMahon, maybe a good idea. Doesn't bother us if that is not done. You're right, these technical drawings define what's going to be built. Um, and there's a lot of them, and it defines very clearly with elevations and plans where things are going to happen and how things are going to happen, and that's great. However, um, I want to emphasize point 1A. Point 1A says the seawall is to be put in place under the existing ground and below grade. In our view, and maybe some engineering folks here could tell us we're wrong, but I don't think we are. That means it's going to have to more closely follow the terrace edge, because that's the only place you can put that wall yeah, sir, underground. Sir, if, if you would speak to the board. Pardon? If you would speak to the board. Okay, I'm sorry. That, that that would have to be placed near the terrace edge, because otherwise it's not going to be underground, under existing ground. Therefore, the plan, the only plan that says where the wall is going to go, the only drawing says it's going to go on the lot line, the div proposed dividing line. If the wall goes there, it's not being placed under existing ground. To be placed under existing ground, it has to be closer to Harbor Road, not by a lot, but by some to be under the edge of the existing terrace. Therefore, we are interested to know if we are to, in fact, get the representations made to us about where the wall is going to go in writing by Mr. McMahon, and I'll read them to you in an email to us on April 26th. There will be a below ground concrete seawall built underground near my lawn. The current riprap, those jumble of organic rocks in front will be temporarily moved and allow precast concrete sections to be put in place under the existing ground and below grade. The riprap will be put back, it'll all be lovely, you won't see the wall. This summarizes those words. If that is to be true, which is what 2A speaks for, and actually 1 through 4 get at, we need new drawings. We need to know where the wall is going to go. So right now, if you were to prove this without that condition, that is to say, let's get a new drawing that says, where is exactly the wall going to go that meets these criteria? It won't be where the TPZ approved it. It will be modestly different. Not critically so, but it won't be there. That's the point I want to emphasize here. We need one through four. We need a new drawing showing exactly where it's going to go to meet those promises made to our group of 50 concerned neighbors who are on that mailing list that we talked about earlier. And we uh, would be very happy to see that happen and, as Mr. Imes said in his letter, support this project. We are concerned, however, if you build the wall where it's shown by the TPZ approval and drawing after they got done with that meeting, you're not going to get what you're paying for here, <laughs> not paying anything. You're not going to get what you think you're getting. You're not going to get what you see. The riprap will necessarily be in front of that wall, and that riprap will be on town property, public property, further obscuring the small bit of sand that we have there and changing seriously the view that you will have from the water of this terrace and the supporting structure. So all's good as long as we understand that, that we do need to meet that, com we believe you should meet that, that commitment from Mr. McMahon should be met and that we need a new drawing showing exactly where the wall will go to actually be put in place as point 1A says. Okay. With that, we will be happy. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? All right. Seeing none, back to the board. Um, any further questions from the board? Yeah, I would, Mr. Timniak? I would ask Mr. Fallon if you could address. Yeah. Um, I'll be brief because I, I know you have a, 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 a busy agenda. Look, I, I, I respect greatly Mr. MacGyver, known him for many years. We disagree on this point. I don't understand his concern because I think the plans are definitive. 
This wall was designed by professional engineers. Uh, it's, it's very detailed in terms of where we're going to tie in with the existing wall. It's been reviewed by the DEP, the town engineer, and the TPZ. Uh, it's going to be placed on our property. There's already is riprap uh, that is there. I can tell you, and I think the plans would document this, that there's no new riprap going further into the town property associated with the construction of this wall. The wall is not going to have any adverse uh, sight line impacts, obviously, because of, as the plans would confirm, it's going to have no negative aesthetic impacts. And at the end of the day, as I said at the beginning, if the concern is we're not going to get what we bargained for, the planning and zoning department will see that you are because these are the plans that have been approved. They're you know, highly detailed. The wall will be constructed in accordance with these plans. If it's not, then the, the town will deal with that through the planning and zoning department because we'd be in violation of our CAM approval. But that's not going to happen. And I, I just, it's harder for me to, be, to respond beyond that because I think the plans, I've been reading plans a long time, I think the plans are very, very clear here. And if the concern is somehow this wall is going to require or result in some further encroachment of riprap onto town property, I can assure you it's not. If you want further reassurance from Mr. Eggers, I can give you that, but I'll defer to you because I know you do have a busy agenda. Uh, answer your question, Mr. Bateson. Could you just go back to the board, John, that has that uh, proposed and existing on the seawall? Mm-hmm. I can find it, Chris. Where is it? Did I put it down? We'll find it, Mr. Bateson. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that one. That's one you're thinking of. Right? And, and you have that in your package too, I think. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, so this is the train that's here now. This section is cut off. Side. But um, this is the rock that's there now, uh, kind of leveled out on top of the lawn. Uh, on the drawings and the plans, the toe, this most waterward rock, is to stay, not, not be moved, not be encroached farther waterward at all, um, and then just rebuild from the same toe location. Will the, will the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hear, but will this, would, would this require any additional riprap being placed further into any aspect of town property than where it is now? No, we're not planning to go waterward at all into the proposed town. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, John. Anything further? No. I'm all set. Okay. okay. I, no. no. Sorry, public comment is over. Public comment is over, gentlemen. Oh. Public comment is over, sir. Um, the, um, all right. Um, there was a comment that came up, I think, in one of the emails that I saw about who has jurisdiction over this. Just want to be clear that it's not within the authority of this board to specify that jurisdiction. It is within the authority and has been delegated to the RTM on, in past uh, purchases of land. It's the RTM that specifies whether it's Parks and Rec or concert open space or possibly the Harbor Commission uh, that specifies that. Uh, I think there may be some Harbor Commission bylaws in terms of the harbor itself that may be considered in doing that. So I don't mean to not consider that, but that uh, is what the process that the town follows in such things. Um, just uh, one question if I could. The other question came up is the height of the wall. Mm -hmm. Can somebody address, uh, based on that diagram, and I assume there are specific heights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Eggers will address that. And compared, uh, and you mentioned it would be the same height as the wall along the yacht yard, I believe? Yeah, so this, is the, it'll, this will be the existing lawn. Um, it'll vary slightly across. What I'm trying to get at is, is there any increase in height over the existing land, or like where that revetment is now? So right here, it'll start off at the um, same height as this lot here. Yep. This land over here is higher than it is here, yep. so it gets blended up to that. Okay, in terms of uh, the length of the wall, that will basically follow the natural grade now? Um, Natural grade is in. Yeah, I mean, it's not. There'll be some landscape in topsoil added where okay. the rock is now. 
Yes. Or be the existing controversy. Okay, thank you. Um, Location. And then again, the location of the wall is specified pretty, I think you specified pretty clearly on that diagram. Could you just review that again? And it, um, the, the, the one that, that planning and zoning approved or would be compared back to what planning and zoning approved? So this is this little lot line here. Um, when it went to plan and zoning, this part was as it is to this little corner. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan sent to plan and zoning actually had the um, wall coming out more water over here. Mm -hmm. what's called the finger. So that got removed. Then this line uh, was redrawn to satisfy the conditions um, of the plan and zoning. We actually, after planning and zoning. Approved, Mr. Fallon, if I could ask you to use the mic. After planning and zoning approved the application, uh, because they had di directed that the, the wall be modified so that this little finger that we were preserving was eliminated, we actually met out in the field uh, with representatives of the race. Uh, Mr. Went was there and uh, Mr. Spath from the Huntington Company. And we literally plotted it in accordance with the PNZ's request. Okay. And it was verified in the field by Mr. Uh, Went as being consistent. And that's when we. I could did this final plan. Okay. All right, thank you. And actually, that was the marker right here. That was the day we did it. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Just trying to clarify some of the uh, questions and emails that we received during the day. Uh, with that, uh, are there any further discussion on the Board of Selectmen? Any motion to amend the item? I don't have a motion to amend. No motion. Just a comment to Mr. McMahon. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, I think since Mr. Fallon referenced it, and it was okay, it seems like uh, adding the four items in on this mem memo. Well, uh, one A through D, and right. three and four. Two was my only concern. Okay. Well, I was looking at one A through D. Those seem to be the, and three and four would be okay. Yes, sir. All right. Just since the uh, applicant has offered that. Sure. It seemed to that help clarify things going forward, so we tie those points off too. Um, How do we do that? Oh. I think perhaps we can add in a sentence that says the uh, this is approved subject to uh, items. 1A through D, and item 3 and item 4 as specified in the Sasquanog uh, memo of 521-19, and as agreed to by the applicant. I'll second that. I, I, I'll second that as well. All right, is that clear enough, Mr. Lesser and Mr. Fallon? Yes, sir. You can put them in there, but this is not a typical situation because you're getting something. So you're saying, we're going to take this condition on you doing these things. If he doesn't do them, you're not going to take it? No, you're going to take it. I think, though, that that if, in as much as he's agreed to do them, I think that if you put them in, you'll be fine. I don't think. But it's not like we're going to do something conditioned on you doing it. You're taking a piece of property. No, I think uh, what we're just trying to clarify, and, and given yeah. this has been discussed for almost two years now, <clears throat> uh, just clarifying as much as we can that the agreement, um, and specifically because this is from the neighborhood and Sasquanag, to include those in, I th think. If uh, you want to put them in and he's going to do them, I think you'll be fine. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's agreeing to it, so we're just yes. trying to. Yeah. Uh, we're it's not. It's a matter of public record that he's agreeing to it. Yeah, okay. That's, that's what I think you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. All right, so we've got a first and a second. Sheila, sure. do you have that? Yes, I do. Down. Okay. Um, may I have, um, I was motioned and seconded, correct? Yes. All right, any further discussion on the amendment? All right. Public, here's your chance again. Any comment from the public on the amendment, but the amendment only, please? Okay. 
It's going back to the board. The item as amended is before us. Um, now it's all stuff to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was the amendment. Uh, voted on the amendment. No, the item as amended. Is that the amendment we voted on? Yeah, we did. Okay. We voted on the amendment. All right. The item as amended is before us. Yeah. And we vote on the item as amended. I would like to, I have all the confidence in the world that Mr. McMahon is going to uh, fulfill the promises made today and make sure that uh, the community is satisfied with the end result. I do have that. So I, I'm absolutely prepared to vote. All right. For this. Mr. Yeah, Bateson. Again, Mr. McMahon, thank you very much. I think I'm, I'm uh, very impressed with your persistence uh, to work this out with the neighborhood over the last two years in order to donate some land to the town. So thank you. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it is seven o'clock. Did anyone want to take a break at this yeah, point? Yeah, you want to take a break? Yep. We're going to pause for about five minutes, and then we'll come right back. Eleven. Uh, from the fire chief and police chief, this requires Board of Finance and RTM approval. This is to hear, consider, and approve a bond resolution entitled a resolution appropriating two million eight hundred ninety seven thousand dollars two hundred and seventy six dollars and forty five cents for the costs associated with the establishment and operation of a Fairfield Westport multi town emergency communication center with the town of Westport. Uh, and authorizing the issue of bonds to finance such appropriation as recommended by the fire chief and police chief. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? Second. I'm going to, let's take a look at the, the next couple here. Um, there's one that talks about the lease. Item 12 talks about the lease. Um, did you want to have both these before so we could talk yeah, you about can, any I, of those I, items? Is I that okay? Happily merge them. All right. Then item 12. Um, to here consider and act upon a following resolution. This requires RTM approval, approving a lease between the town of Fairfield, town of Westport, and Sacred Heart University for premises used uh, as joint 911 emergency communication center as recommended by the fire chief and police chief and resolve that the lease between the town of Fairfield and the town of Westport uh, as tenants in Sacred Heart University as landlord covering the premises consisting of 2,352 square feet of the first floor of the east building of the Sacred Heart University property located at 3135 Eastern Turnpike, Fairfield, Connecticut upon the terms and conditions and for uses and purposes contained in said lease is hereby approved and further resolved that the first selectman is hereby be and hereby is authorized to execute such documents as may be required to effectuate this resolution. May I have a motion to accept? Make a motion. And a second. Second. So both those motions are, are jointly before us here. Um, police chief, fire chief, who is going to take this up? Who's your designated spokesman? Okay. <laughs> Chris Liddy, Chief of Police. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to turn it over to Deputy Chief Smith in a, in a second, but just to set the stage, uh, we've been working on this project for about a year and a half now. Um, opportunities presented itself when Sacred Heart University showed us a space that uh, that fit 99% of our needs and offered it to us for a dollar a year. <clears throat> and we began talking to Westport and realized that we had our concerns we were going to move our ECC, had to move our ECC at some point in time, um, it being in the flood zone, end of life issues with equipment. Westport was also considering the same. So for the last year and a half, we've had discussions to see if our operations could work in a joint atmosphere. And it's a complex issue. There, there are many moving parts in this. Um, 
we get along with the town of Westport very, very well. It was a matter of could we live with each other? And I think we've come to that point in time where the answer is yes, that, um, that we can do this, we can do this responsibly, we can do this in an atmosphere that, that improves service levels to both of our communities, and, um, and we can do it ultimately for less money. So everything made sense. I'm sure you may have some questions, so I would ask uh, Deputy Chief Smith to come up and address the specific questions. Thank you. Chief, thank you. Uh, Don Smith, Deputy Police Chief. So you know, the Chief gave the basic overview. It's sort of the perfect storm where we've been looking to move our communication center for a while now. We just have not been able to find a location, get it out of our basement, out of the flood zone, some of the issues with the lack of the ability to insure equipment that's in the basement, and that's where everything currently is. And then with Westport being in the same boat, they are required, they've got to move and relocate their two centers into one. And Sacred Heart presented a perfect opportunity in that the space was their corporate security console, so it's basically built out for what we need. So moving to that location saves us a lot of money from building a brand new center in a building that was not designed to house a communication center and meet the requirements that are set by the state, FBI, and NFPA in building out communication centers. So it worked out to be sort of a perfect deal. And along with that, the state of Connecticut over the last several years has been putting legislation forward, has not passed yet, but again on the table this year, are different bills that are on the table to be reviewed that would require communities at some point to consolidate their 911 centers. So we want to get ahead of the game with that before all of a sudden we're stuck having to do it and not prepared to do it. And again, having the space, having a partner to build out the space gives us a lot of advantages. Financially, it gives us advantages because we're going to split the cost to build the center on a 50-50 split with Westport. So moving forward, we have that. And the other advantages we've got besides outside the flood zone, it increases some annual subsidies to the center. So combining two municipalities, we receive subsidies from the state for the 911. It increases that amount to help offset annual operating costs. We're gonna see service level improvements by having more dispatchers together in a center and work as a combined center so that all the dispatchers can chip in if one town real, it gets really busy they can help that town out, whether it's Fairfield, we get hit with something and we need additional people to answer 911, or Westport, a truly combined center, which is sort of a first for the state of Connecticut. So far, although you have some regional centers, a lot of those are more fire EMS based, this is gonna be one of the first times police departments merge into one. So we'll see an increase of efficiency during large incidents. Um, and as the chief said, we've been planning on this Really hot and heavy, there's been a group, a work group that's been put together that's had representatives from Westport Fire, Westport Police, Fairfield Fire, Fairfield PD, working through this process to get it to where we can finally bring it in front of you to move the project forward. Um, and again, I mentioned Sacred Heart. So that's why we're here today, is to start looking at, to get the build out, to work off some timelines. Westport's sort of under a timeline because the state shut down one of their 911 centers. They used to have two, one at police and one at fire and they're working off of that, so they're sort of in a time frame, they've got to do something, so we've got to try to move the, forward, the project forward as quickly as we can uh, to meet some of their deadlines. So we put together what you've got is the uh, proposed build budget, as well as signing the lease with Sacred Heart so we can start to, start to have access to the facility to get some contractors in, get some, uh, you know, to see what we got to do to renovate the space, because we are gonna have to do some renovations. All right, any questions from the board? Uh, thank you very much. This is something I absolutely fully support. Uh, uh, I think it moves us in the right direction, something I've been advocating for for, for many years now in regionalizing with another town. Uh, I'm happy to hear that we're friends with, um, with uh, Westport. Uh, I'm excited to find out how livable we can be, two towns in one roof. Uh, I also went and I took a tour of the, uh, the future dispatch center and uh, it, it's, it's very, it, I mean, Chief, I think you were right when it said it probably meets 99% of what, what we're looking for. I mean, it's, it's a good structure, all set to go. Uh, and you know what, a big thank you to Sacred Heart, you know, offering this to us for a dollar a year. Um, and uh, allowing us to uh, utilize their campus, I think, is another 
uh, step in the right direction uh, in what I hope to be a very long-term, you know, Fairfield, Sacred Heart University, um, you know, relationship we have. And hopefully we, this is one step and we can build off another step and, um, you know, we can continue to uh, make, both universities part of our town. I think it's a, I think it's a great move. I fully support it. And, and thank you, thank you to both chiefs uh, for working hard. And and thank you to the first selectman of Westport, and the first selectman of Fairfield for uh, engaging this. It's I mean it's a big, it's a big step moving in. There. And I mean, also I mean you have a union, two unions, right? Two different towns. A few more unions than that, but yeah. 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 So I mean, this is this is bigger than 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 the way it's being made out. I mean, this is this is a a, a very impressive step. So I'm very happy for the town of Fairfield, and uh, like I said, I'm enthusiastically going to vote for this. All right, Mr. Bateson, any comments? Yeah, I I share Chris's thoughts on this. This is the way we're going, and I, I think this is a great first step to get there. I. I hear that in, the, in this presentation we talk about a lot about operations, but Ed, to you, as, how do you see the administration of this? I mean, is this going to be us now running it? it how, how do you envision yeah. that? I mean, operations, I understand that I see a lot in this, but administration-wise, yeah. what do you think? There will be a, another presentation coming up uh, in a couple months to this board. Uh, laying out um, that operation in, in more detail as well as a projected budget and everything in terms of how costs will be shared and split on uh, what happens. But uh, let me ask uh, Deputy Chief Smith to, to take us through at least uh, an overview of that. So the, the current uh, proposal which we've worked with Westport on to try to move forward is uh, Fairfield is going to have control over the center. Um, we're gonna, they're going to be our employees. And the, the basic structure is going to be they're going to answer to a police captain, the chief of police, and the first selectman. There is going to be an operational board that's put together of the two police chiefs and two fire chiefs that will be involved in all the processes. At the end of the day, it is Fairfield's final decision, but we want to make sure that our partner in Westport has feels part of the process, is part of the process, and helps us work on policies, procedures, has some input into the budget because they're going to be contributing you know, to paying off the budget annually. So that's part of how we're working together as the group. They're going to have the, their say in this board. Now, I imagine you're talking, you're referencing the definitive agreement which is coming down the road afterwards, right? Yes. You're talking about which is going to hammer out all the finer points? Yes. We've got, we've got uh, kind of a, some, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, we have a term sheet that's, that's put together that, that uh, we've been using to review with all four departments. Yep. All right, as well as our ECC people, so they know how things will work. Uh, we uh, are putting together a detailed annual budget. Uh, the goal is to have this kick off on January 1st. We need the capital planning to start now because we have equipment to order and install to get it set up. Um, it's been a very, um, there's a, the police chiefs and fire chiefs will be on an operational board that will set the, um, service level parameters, the, the service metrics, if you will, for how this operates to make sure that the residents in Fairfield and the residents in West, Westport uh, see higher le service levels than they're currently seeing. Not that we have a problem with our service levels, but we want to make sure that we maintain those. Um, this is exciting from that standpoint because we get to, to lay all that out. It's, it's been a, a very uh, innovative, creative uh, discussion with the four departments, if you will, that are coming together to do this. Uh, we've merged our police and fire years ago, so we don't have that step to go through. Westport's going through that step now. As part of this, the state is also encouraging it and that they're providing, I think as Deputy Chief uh, mentioned, $500,000 in funding to help um, us in financing the transition. Now, of the dollars that are included here on that, uh, those are dollars that are being split with Westport. Um, so this, this, if you will, the, the numbers here are split kind of 50-50 with Westport for the most part. I think they've got uh, one grant that covers another couple hundred thousand dollars more than we do. Um, so it's, it's kind of the right thing at the right time. And, and I think Mr. Timniak said it really well. It is a new partnership with Sacred Heart. Uh, and they've stepped up the plate big time, and, and we get to use what was the former International Communication Center for GE, uh, and we get to put that to good use. 
Um, certainly Sacred Heart may not have needed quite all that horsepower. Um, so it may have been dismantled at some point. We get to go in there and use it and make sure that uh, it has a long life for the town of Fairfield. I want to follow up on the, uh, actually in here we're approving a bond resolution, right? Correct. In there, it, it, it seems like the semantics of this are that we're borrowing the money, the town, and Westport is going to be paying us back. And I imagine all that is going to be, all this is contingent upon an agreement, the definitive agreement. I imagine that repayment is going to be negotiated in the definitive agreement. Well, the, the, the repayment is, is it's going to be 50-50. After you, you, there's 250. we're getting a note from Westport. I imagine that's all stuff that's going to. That's that side of it, yes. But Okay, so we're going to see that agreement months down the road when we sign off on the definitive yep. agreement. What we want to do is we gave you, we provided a letter of intent here signed by both first selectmen just so that, that everybody's clear that is the intent. You're absolutely right. Okay, so we're borrowing all the money, getting our money back from Westport. Okay. At least it, it allows us to do that. If we find out a better financial arrangement between now and when we do that, would the CFO like to comment on that? Oh, you're still here. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, all of the bond, basically the idea here and the concept is, as you can read in the letter of intent, is that this, this multi-city operation will be managed by the town of Fairfield, Connecticut. And with all our bonding resolutions for any, we always request an authorization to bond the total amount, but we only bond that amount for which we'll end up spending out of our coffers. Yeah, I, I, I know right, that part, but right. also too so in the so bond in it case, says we're going to recover the cost from Right, so in this case, yeah, but so we, uh, we will probably only bond a million two. I think it's a million two, five, six, or some number like that. The state's going to pay. Two hundred, uh, five hundred thousand dollars, and um, we're going to pay one million two. They're going to pay one million two. They being Westport, plus an additional two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars that they need to upgrade their CAD system. Um, we need to spend twenty-seven thousand five hundred to update our CAD system. We're ahead of them on that. So we'll we'll authorize the full amount when we get to the point where we start buying equipment. Uh, that will be handled either us buying it and them reimbursing us, or they might buy half and we might buy half. It might have be half invoiced. That, that, that would just be a financial decision at the time. But the total that we'll, we will not bond probably more than the one million two. Okay. In fact, we will not bond more than the one million two. I'm good for now. All right. Should also be noted too, Westport already has their half approved by their town boards. So their, their build money has already been approved. All right, any further comments from the board? Any comments from the public? Seeing none, back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you, Chiefs. Well, that's one. Let's get the lease is up next. That's been moved and second. Any comments on the lease? None here. Mr. Bateson? Good. All right, any comments from the public on the lease? All right, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. The lease is now approved. All right. Next up, item 13, to hear a report from Fairfield Public Schools on state reimbursement for school projects, including the Sherman Project.
Okay, good evening. Um, my name is Sal Morbido, I'm manager of construction security and safety for Fairfield Schools. Um, update on um, reimbursement for the state. I had sent along a matrix that showed our status on various projects. Uh, very recently, we closed out our oldest uh, open project, which was Tomlinson Middle School. Um, our appeal of that audit uh, resulted in uh, a swing on the reimbursement, total reimbursement of over $500,000, um, and we closed uh, favorable to Town of Fairfield. Uh, Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was a big swing and it was very good for us, good for the home team. Uh, other, we have a lot of closed projects. Right now we are uh, still open on our security projects for window hardening, uh, Fairfield Woods Roof, um, Holland Hill Portables, which were the temporary swing space for the um, renovation project, uh, the Tomlinson Roof, replacement uh, project is closed out and Holland Hill extension and alterations is still open there. These are projects that are still being um, worked on and normal application for payments are going in on those. Um, from there, I was, um, there were questions I believe about Sherman project so I was ready well, to answer your questions about Sherman. Okay. Well, we referenced Sherman. The question on the reimbursements is, it seemed the percentages were going out and what was eligible cost or not. I, we, we went from expecting to get um, $2 million or so back on Sherman to nothing uh, based on, um, and that was cause for concern and, and I think this board was looking for an update as, as to what's taking place with school reimbursement, uh, changes to what's eligible and what isn't. Uh, okay. Traditionally, if I were to generalize, we were getting about 25% back and, and operationally or, or it was uh, getting reduced to about 20% in actual projects because of things we built in that were not eligible for reimbursement. Correct. Um, but Sherman going to zero. Yeah, uh, it went down to about 3% from, um, from what was roughly 20%. Um, the build, the changes to state reimbursement there's, there actually isn't a change to the written rules. Um, there was a bill up for changing the reimbursement rate this year. It was Senate Bill, uh, I believe it was 874, and there was one section in there that would have reduced our, our uh, gross reimbursement rate from 25 percent. Might have moved it down a couple of points, but that has the latest version that's been written out, so the legislature doesn't have that in front of them to act on that. So that means July 1, 19 through June, there, unless something extraordinary happens in the legislature, they're not changing the reimbursement rate. What changes with the with Sherman was there were several items that were um, ineligible, such as the lockers. That's considered a replacement, so that's not an eligible cost. The uh, Two big differences that we saw with this, this project, according to uh, OSCGNR, compared to what we were expecting is, number one, the sprinkler system, uh, they wanted to file, if we filed for that, they wanted us to file it as a code violation project. Uh, technically, there's not a code violation there. There's not a requirement for sprinklers in an existing school building but it's strongly recommended. Um, it benefits us, it keeps us safe, it makes sure that we have continuity of usage of the building mm -hmm. in case of a fire event. That being said, I don't see it as a fire marshal coming to us and saying, you're violating section such and such of the fire code, you, should, you need to put in sprinkler system. So anyway, they want it to, to be filed as a code violation and on top of that, if we did that, they wanted other violations cleared up, such as accessibility. So that would have added more scope to the project, and more cost to the project to comply with that statement than we would have gotten for a reimbursement of, it would have been a wash at best. So that section of the work was 
not going to be filed. The other section was the uh, air the addition of air conditioning basically as a standalone project. There was an addition entailed uh, for the stage. Um, and that would bring us into what they call an extension alteration project. And we've had extension alteration projects. That's our typical filing for large projects, such as Riverfield, Strathfield, Holland Hill, with air conditioning added. So we did not see that as an ineligible, um, ineligible cost. Uh, because the project was primarily just for that item, they were saying that it was ineligible. So what you're saying is because the majority of dollars at Sherman were for air conditioning work, they considered an air conditioning project, not a renovation of the school. Correct. So um, the typical person that we would go to even get an appeal on that actually came in and joined our conference, which is the uh, director of OSCGNR, and uh, basically he reinforced that decision. So we just accepted the fact that they're stating that that is an ineligible, uh, that portion of work is ineligible, yeah. which led to the electrical system upgrade also being ineligible because the reason that we're upgrading it was for the air conditioning. So a large, large block of the costs were deemed ineligible in our uh, conceptual design review. Okay, so if I might, just to clarify, what that would lead me to assume then is that as we look at air conditioning future buildings, if that is the majority of the project, that would also not be subject for reimbursement. That's what I would take that as, yes. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt nope, no, the that's fine. presentation. Um, so uh, the other categories of work, the um, parking lot, uh, the site work, for the most part was deemed to be eligible, but that wasn't a large cost factor uh, in, in the whole project. So um, out, of the, out of the five sections, the addition, which would have been reimbursable, was our alternate and has that scope has been shed off. The air conditioning was made ineligible. The sprinkler system was made uh, unpalatable yeah. uh, because it would have ended up costing us more money than it would have brought us. And that's how you ended up with that very low net reimbursement rate that uh, yeah. Chairman Lang uh, reported to you. In uh, prior projects, and I think back to the ward roof uh, when we were doing that, there was a state requirement of, of what the slope of that roof had to be. It didn't make sense to us to build it up that high because it, it chewed up all the reimbursement and then some. Yeah. But we were able to go to our state delegation and get a notwithstanding uh, bill passed that allowed us to get reimbursed for ward in that. Uh, do we have an opportunity to go to our state delegation and get a notwithstanding for the air conditioning going in here since we're really putting the air conditioning in not to just make it pleasant for our kids but from a health issue from and because of a school security issue if we can't keep the windows open this becomes uh, a really important component so it's not the luxury that it might have been perceived to be 30 40 50 years ago right. it's really necessary for school security and when you look at the schools themselves uh, there are more than a few examples of mold buildup in schools and air conditioning certainly helps with that in terms of improving the, build, the building function and life uh, as well as the health and safety of our students and faculty and staff. Any, uh, any chance of us getting a notwithstanding or some help from our state delegation to get the reimbursement for this anyway? And on uh, future projects, I mean, I'm... Um, correct, correct. Um, on, um, on future standalone projects, uh, that might be the way to proceed on it. Uh, timing, I'm not sure that the timing would actually work out for you because the um, getting that bill in, I'm not sure if they can get the bill in, but that's something to talk to the delegation. But uh, delegation can always put in whatever bill they want, whether it's supported or not. Um, or flowers bigger than me. Maybe it's maybe it's one of the benefits of a special session. I hear they're going to have. Yeah. Okay, possible. Um, that would lead us to. But, and I don't mean to belabor it here when we don't have the answer. But if we could follow up after this with our state delegation to see if it's possible sure. and find out what the rules are for any future projects we may do, because I think again, air conditioning is both a health 
and a security issue, and it's not the, again, again the perceived luxury it might have been right. 40 or and 50 years ago. Yeah, many of the projects, they're, they're, um, the, the biggest change to the reimbursement process is that they get involved much earlier in the design and are putting their fingerprints on it, so to speak, mm -hmm. in that they'll try to right-size the project, they'll try to time the project filing so that um, they're not committing to money this year when the actual work won't happen for two more years, uh, items like that, and that's part of the reason why uh, the state bonding of schools has gone from numbers like 600,000, uh, $600 million worth of bond to half of that um, in recent the past couple of years. So they've really worked to, to lower their exposure. And it's also there's these subtle changes to the way that they're interpreting the statutes that they're enforcing that uh, make a difference. All right, thank you. Any other comments from the board? I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, air conditioning is right now about the health and the safety of the kids. Uh, positive changes. Uh, it is no longer the luxury it was perceived to be, you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, and, I, you know, I look at where we're at right now as a town. I look at our fund balance. I look at the projected surplus we have for the end of this year. Um, you know, and I look at what Mr. Morbido was just talking about in the governor's debt diet and, you know, the harder and harder it is for us to get reimbursement, you know, I, I would be willing to consider um, a motion or a resolution directing our surplus this year to go fund as much air conditioning as we possibly can to fulfill uh, the elementary schools. I would think that would be something that, um, on one hand, we don't control, but I think we could make that recommendation to the Board of Finance. I, I would I would encourage us to do that. Okay. I certainly would. Is that something you want to take up right now, or you want to take that up at the next meeting? Uh, I would be willing to take it up at the next meeting. I mean, we have, uh, I mean, <laughs> we have a pretty aggressive uh, uh, meeting right now on our plate, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he hearing this now, I think, uh, yeah, I think if there's, um, if there's something to do, uh, you know, we heard during the budget process, uh, the health of our, our fund balance, the surplus we have, and I don't know how that would equate to what projects we currently have on the board, but I, I, I absolutely think um, now is the time to move forward. And you know what, if, if we don't get state reimbursement, hey, you know what, we're talking about redoing a marina over health and safety purposes for something we don't, you know, we haven't seen that necessarily uh, come back in many, many years, knock on wood, but uh, I, I would certainly think the comfort of our kids is more, uh, you know, more important than finger docks. Uh, very good observations. Mr. Marbino, any other advice for us uh, as you look at the future of reimbursements? Um, we're still learning their, their process is changing, it changes every year. Um, they're, they're changing their application system and um, don't have any recommendations right now other than to watch the process um, going for uh, notwithstandings is not our usual path. Um, Fairfield Ward was an unusual subject that would, you only brought up one of the points that was uh, uh, strange to that one. There were a couple others that we the special legislation helped us with. So uh, each case is unique. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to the state delegates to see what they can do to help us. Okay, very good. Thank you, and thank you for giving the update to the board. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up, item 14 uh, from the superintendent of schools to hear an, uh, a report on school enrollment projections. Good evening, Tony Jones, school superintendent. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, you do have a packet that was sent to you, mm -hmm. and so I will walk you through, and it's enrollment projections and our utilization, and it's because those two really go together. Um, on the first page where it talks about building utilization and updates, um, this is first of all just to let you know what's in the packet. We will just show you the 27 through 28 enrollment projections, which means we have nine years. This was a 10-year projection. This was year number one. Um, the second item is looking at building utilization 
um, from four different colors just to make it more simplistic. Um, the elementary utilization is aimed at 90%. It says on the packet 85 to 90, the board clarified that last night because uh, they were reviewing all of their guidelines. They've been doing a lot of facilities work this year. Um, we have been in a two-year discussion about pre-K through 12 facilities adjustments. And one of the issues that really emerged this year is preschool. Uh, preschool is at a critical point and um, we must have a decision for our preschoolers. If I'll get you to look at the next page, which, which talks about um, the rapidly outgrown ECC school site. And this is new from when we were presenting to you last year as we've really dug in to figure out and problem solve. And we really have to look at our facilities right now from a pre-K through five lens, not just kindergarten through fifth grade. And what you're seeing here is when you go back to 2009, 2010, there were 75 students. Um, and as a reminder, this is required by federal law. This is not a program that is like universal pre-K where it's optional. Um, when you look at this year, we have, we're still growing. We will between now and the very end of the school year. 165 students. We are ready for an extra have 172 students pre-enrolled. And this is, when you look below, a, a building at our current UCC that was built for 84 students. So as of next year, I think a lot of people don't realize there's been a lot of discussion this year about are we going to have two sites, is it going to be one? We're in our second year of already housing part of our UCC program at Stratfield. Next year will be year number three. And we will have four uh, early childhood classrooms at Stratfield. And so when you think about that, Stratfield was built for four kindergarten classrooms. Those classrooms now are pre-K. So that building has become a pre-K through five building. And we have six at ECC. If you go to the next page, just a little bit about why this is important. Um, because pre-K must be re relocated into the elementary schools to resolve overcrowding at our ECC ward site. And if you think about 172 children, whether we leave a few at the existing site, whether we move all of them, 172 children is a lot, and this is a growing program. And while it's very difficult to estimate, it would not surprise me as the school superintendent if we see this program hit 200 next year uh, with the growth that we've seen. And this program is also located at Ward right now, which is over capacity. That's really not an issue for us today. I think it's just informational in that that building itself is also over capacity, so you can't expand uh, even if we wanted to at Ward. What you see on the next uh, page for 2019-2020, this is next year's uh, projected building utilization. And the board has been looking at this all spring. And I think it's a very helpful graphic for people to understand that we don't have seats all around the district or buildings that really have extremely low utilization. Um, because when you look at utilization, this is how many classrooms are available for K-5, and it's now becoming pre-K-5. And when you look at the red, we don't want buildings in the red. That's a 95% or higher. We're trying to set that at 90%. That means they're over capacity. And some of these buildings, those two on the bottom, are well over capacity. Um, we really would like to see buildings that are in between blue and red that are at the 90. And the yellow is under and the green is underutilized. Now on this map, I want you to note though that Holland Hill right now is noted where it will be next year because the new construction opens. So it's ready now to be able to move more students into that building, which the board has said for several years. Um, if you turn to the next page, this is a timeline the Board of Ed has been discussing for, I think, the past two months. Um, this We had our second meeting, I believe, with this timeline last night. And it's really looking at what is going to happen with the UCC ward. And again, this is just proposed just to give an example. It doesn't really matter which buildings you go to. Uh, we have to find space for early childhood uh, right now. They're discussing ECC Holland Hill and North Stratfield. And are those the right elementaries to move uh, more students into? We've gone through an exhaustive process trying to decide that. And it, and it gets down to things like how many restrooms, uh, classrooms with restrooms are there in the building? So that if pre-K is located there, kindergarten still has restrooms. Um, do they have ample space for a pre-K playground? So the board's really done a lot of study with that. When you turn to the next page, 
uh, you'll see the utilization start to change with two of the buildings that have the larger blue dots. And that's important because you need to have space in your buildings, um, not only for growth, but you know for issues that could arise in the horizon as well. This is showing you that those buildings just turned to blue. That's because of preschool. That's because of preschool enrollment that is now going out, um, utilizing our buildings highly effectively, but it does have an impact on how we need to be viewing utilization across the district. On the next page, um, you'll see the elementary school projections, and these are the projections that were done by Malone and McBroom. Um, this is the 10-year projection. Each year, they slightly update the next year. They don't change radically, um, but this is the projection going through 2027, 2028. And one thing you will note, Mill Hill's right in the middle, and you'll see that it has 341, 347, but just looking at nine years, it goes up to 382. So this building, it is growing. On the next page, drills down a little bit farther for you um, to look at Mill Hill. And it starts on 2019, 2020, which is next year on that far left-hand side, with 347 students. But the one thing I want to point out about these projections is that Malone and McBroom have been incredibly accurate for us um, since they've been doing our projections, less than a half a percent, not even that, um, across the district. And this year they projected at Mill Hill 341 students, we had 346. And that is very, that's, that's great projection. Um, when you look at the bottom, you'll see the projection increase across elementary. I wanted to overlay that on, right underneath Mill Hill. We're projecting across elementary to go up 193 students just in the next nine years. And a lot of people are looking at the trough right now in elementary, and I know you're aware in the budget last year and in this year, I showed where elementary is going to go back up, middle school and high school will go down, and that's kind of a trend we see in schools. But on top of that, we need to be very thoughtful of those 172 preschoolers. And how many can we leave at UCC? How many are need, need to go out into our K-5 settings to become pre-K-5? Which means that's a total projected 365 students. And that's before we consider any sort of economic development in town, uh, just natural growth. It's a, it's a lot of seats that we need in our schools. When you turn to the next page, because I knew obviously we're talking about Mill Hill tonight, so I just wanted to give you what is the utilization if the building were 378, 441, or 504 based on current enrollment of 346. So that's how many children are, are there. Uh, 378, they would already be at 92%. So we're over what is recommended of the 90%. We really have no room there. 441 would be 78, and again, that's on current enrollment. And 504 would be 69. So again, that's current enrollment. But when you go over to the right and you start looking at 27, 28, 378 would be over 100%. We would be renovating and expanding a building that is full. Uh, 441 is still at 87%. And 504 is at 76. And you think, well, 76, that's great. That gives us some room. And it does, if you think about, we, we have Mill Hill and Sherman, both are in the red. They're over capacity right now, and we're concerned about that. And down on the bottom, it gives you an idea how a demographer is going to look at this building. So if you build a building that is 504 students, and we want that building, I'm going to hop down to the second line, because the board's decided 90%. They're looking at that building with 453 students in it, which means you have a little bit of room if you have your enrollment growth spike, uh, economic development, any of those things that can happen in town, which means we at least have 71 seats available. And 71 seats, is that's not a lot of availability um, on that portion of town. When you look down at the bottom with a 441, and we have 90% capacity, a demographer is going to say, okay, 90%, that's 396 students. So if we're going to move children out of their home schools and around this district, we're not going to go above that. That's best practice. We have 14 seats. So we really can't, with 441, we are not helping uh, really with that 50-year vision of a school, and not just, not just the eight-year vision. And on the next page, I know you had specifically asked for this, just to look at also middle school and high school, just to be knowledgeable. Um, this is our middle school projection. 
And down on the bottom, you'll see middle school is going down, but that's actually uh, fortunate for us because we are well over capacity. Um, on that 2728 utilization at the bottom, on the right hand side, you can see the capacity of the buildings 875, 840, and 700. If you look at uh, Roger Ludlow right now in the red, they're at 830. They're already in the high 90s. Um, 910 at Woods, they're well over the capacity of 840. And that's the full capacity. That's not uh, looking at it as 85%. Um, and then Tomlinson is at 662. It's very high. That's the only building that's going to come down. Well, there'll be a little bit of space there. And you know, I want to point out that sometimes elementary and middle school projections, I think it's, and utilization, it's important to look at them together. Um, if you look at what happened in our region this year, and I know that you probably have paid attention, we've had Stanford have to relocate elementary, we had Greenwich relocated in elementary, and we also had Westport have to relocate in elementary. And their middle schools, in some of these instances, came in very handy for, to look at like a fifth grade option to get through something that's happening in the district. So headroom is very important. Next you have the high school projection. And when you look at the high school, I do have a new sheet, I just, and I can hand that to you later, that shows the same uh, number on the bottom. One of the board members thought that would be helpful to see. Uh, both of the buildings are over capacity right now for both high schools. Um, and with both of the high schools, even though their enrollment goes down, they're, they're uh, still high with their utilization. So it's a good thing that it's actually coming back down. So that is our enrollment projections. Um, that's what utilization is looking like for us um, going forward the next nine years. All right, thank you. Any questions from the board? Why is um, the ECC growing so much? Um, you know, that's a great question. I think there's, it's, there's, there are many, many layers to that answer. To, you know, as we get together as educators, I think um, technology has made a difference in child find. Uh, by law, it's our, it's our job to go out in the community and see children who have special needs from birth, you know, to three, three to five. And I think parents now are more aware. The hospitals are aware of making children, making sure parents know about early intervention. Preschools are more aware. Um, we also, I think, are better with science and having more children who have significant needs when they're born uh, preterm that are able to survive. Um, so I think there are a multitude of reasons and um, we anticipate that it is probably going to continue. All right, any further questions from the board? Mr. Bateson. Yeah, uh, Dr. Jones, BOE timeline. Yes. I see in 2020, 2021 ECC ward disappears. That has been the discussion right now. Um, discussion that hasn't been action. No, we know that. Uh, well, like I said, we already have four classrooms out of the ten that are already out at Stratford next year. The debate right now is, are we going to keep any at ECC Ward, um, or are we going to have the same preschool model for both sites? Because if you keep a program at ECC Ward and then you have a program out in an elementary, they are two different programs, even though the children all have the same needs. Um, and we had the first read last night. And that will be that will be an ongoing discussion that will be on our next board agenda again. So whether it's 172, let's say we have 200 children, how many will how many seats are we going to need? We're still going to need a lot, but that number will be determined. When did we do ECC Ward? It was they started the process in 2003 and it opened in 2005. Yeah. Could you give me the dollar amount we invest in that? Uh, I, yes, I, I have that actually. I can send that to you. Thank you. I believe it's 1.7. So Ward High School is currently 1,479 students enrolled over capacity. That's that's the high. The high school is over capacity. Yes. Yeah. So it's overcrowded by 79 students. Yeah. Actually, let me give you the new high school sheet. Yeah. Give me one too. Thank you. 
this is just the updated information, so it looks more like middle school. Um, so you can see down on the bottom where it's a little bit easier to read instead of me just doing it orally. Um, Fairford Ward High School currently has 1,485. And this is current, like right now. Um, Ludlow is at 1,528. So you can see uh, Ludlow is built for 1,525. So it's completely full. And uh, Ward was built for 1,400, so it's 85 students over right now. And um, in the next few years, we will be watching high school very closely because it came in over projection this year, which I know we talked about during the budget, um, because of the migration of eighth to ninth and more students choosing to stay with us. So I'm looking at this and it shows over a 10 year period, the projection going down by 300 students. Right, and that's going to be fantastic because what that's going to do when you look over is the capacity is actually still going to be at 87 and 90 mm -hmm. instead of which we would like to be at 85. So when their enrollment goes down, it'll give us breathing room at the high school. So it's not like it goes down and then it's like, great, it's that we're so, we're, we're so over right now. I guess is what I'm looking at and I'm thinking about the ECC move because um, it's trending down. Um, meaning it'll be less than it is currently. Um, is it worth moving the ECC or considering moving the ECC, seeing that it's not going to be a log jam uh, at all? Well, I think the board is considering so many different factors right now, and um, you have to look at it from more than just a facility. And so we've looked at the facility aspect, but they're also looking at the program aspect, um, listening to parents, listening to community, listening to staff. And that's a big debate because a preschool in a K-5 building is different than a preschool that is in a separate site. Um, but again, that's a board of ed decision, and they're working through that right now. We had the first read last night. Again, it'll be, I believe, on our next agenda. But regardless of whether they keep that site or not, um, for high school, you know, or for ECC, we have a lot of children that need seats in our K-5 buildings. And it's going to continue to grow. Any further questions? No. Um, obviously, there are a lot of big population issues, projections, and, and big movements going on. There's uh, redistricting. There's uh, racial imbalance. There's the ECC. Um, any guidance or uh, in terms of the timing of those things? I, it um, I, right now, the board is working very. They have all year. If you if you've been to the meetings, we've had some meetings where the audience has been very full because they are using the word redistricting very open. They've been very transparent about it. That we have. Um, currently Mill Hill right now and Sherman, which are well over capacity. Um, we do have Holland Hill opening, which they have you know, said for a long time that we've needed those seats. Um, and they're looking at next year hiring Malone McBroom. The money is built into the budget um, to be able to, again, come and work with the board to look at w how we would best utilize our, our buildings and the space to equalize. Um, and again, aiming for that 90% utilization so that one building is not overcrowded and another one is under. Um, and that will take the experts um, and that's the work for next year okay any idea when if we're going to do any of those things when do those plans come into effect um, well I I don't want to speak for the board and Ms. Vitale may want to but but part of that is making sure come on up yeah <laughs> Christine Vitale um, Board of Education chair so at the beginning of this year the board adopted a board goal which basically looks at facilities utilization with the lens at overcrowding and racial imbalance district-wide. As Dr. Jones said, our number one priority, the first thing we were looking at was the increase in the preschool population. We have outgrown ward. Um, we're in the elementary schools now. I won't get into the whole programmatic differences, but there are. I mean, having a preschool in a dedicated spot, as opposed to K through five, both offer real benefits, but they are different. Um, we went through various scenarios of trying to a debate, do we put the whole ECC in one location that has space for up to 300 children? That really let us know where there wasn't any private space that we could access. We talked to Mr. Tetro earlier in the year about if there's any town buildings that we possibly could access. We looked at Oldfield. That was ruled out. Um, we considered whether or not we would take over an elementary school for the ECC. That was ruled out. 
we work through various, looking at all of our elementary schools, because as Dr. Jones said, they were all options, and viewed them through the lens of does it have parking, does it have bathrooms, does it have stairs, you know, does it have, what's the access like to the playground? Is there space for the preschool playground? And we also factored in the utilization. Where is their space? Because we're going to have to act relatively quickly on the ECC. So we wanted to scaffold it. Be prepared to move ECC children first, because we're out of room, and then build in those sites for a future redistricting that would address the space issues at the elementary schools. <laughs> so the timeline that is in um, your packet is really the timeline that we're looking at for the ECC. The board needs to act on what locations we ultimately want to have them at. It will be more than one, because right now, and I'll, anyone in the audience or any of you gentlemen have a suggestion for an ECC site that can house upwards of 300 children without much expense and move-in ready, um, that's where we are right now. We had a first read last night. Um, we're planning on, you know, it's going to be on our next agenda, our first meeting in June. And I really left it at the board. Um, taking staff recommendation that Holland Hill and North Stratfield were two locations for the ECC. Um, the board was still kind of wrestling with the fact that the location at the high school was there wasn't a financial investment that was made that we are sensitive to, and the space is designed for preschoolers. So um, that's where we are with the board. Um, board members are going to be deciding where they stand on whether or not we want to keep a, um, a classroom or multiple classrooms at Ward and have some in the elementary school as well. As far as the elementary school piece, um, we are also working on a charge from Alona McBroom going back to that board goal of looking at 90% utilization at the elementary school, giving them the guidance for 85% at the secondary school, appreciating that as you move kids around at the elementary school level, it could impact where they, you know, middle school and high school. Um, we're at a holding pounder with that because you need to make the ECC decision first. Once that's made, we'll move forward with the charge from Alone McBroom, um, how this discussion's here about Mill Hill. We'll also give some guidance in terms of, you know, direction. Um, we potentially move elementary schoolers. Sherman, as you can see by the map, is a concern due to the overcrowding and just where growth is in town. Um, we don't see really a huge decline in Sherman over the next 10 years. Um, both just it's a desired place to live and a lot of the conversations that are happening with TOD and the Strategic Planning Committee, it, it just seems that that's where our town is going. And if you just, you don't even need a consultant. Um, just drive around town and you can see small capes, larger homes, you go to East Long, Catherine, that side of Reef Road, I think there's going to be turn turnover there, and I wonder where those kids are going to go. Well, they're going to go to Mill Hill, and hopefully you'll make a decision today that we'll put 504 seats there so there'll be room for those children. Um, if you go smaller, ma, you know, we still have kids at Sherman. If that continues to grow, where are they going to go? S we want to keep them as close to their home as possible. So you're going to either send them east to Holland Hill, you're going to send them west to Mill Hill. If there's not enough room in Mill Hill, then you have the potential of moving kids that are currently Mill Hill up to Dwight. And you get that kind of clockwise movement of children that was included in the racial imbalance plan that Malone and McBroom did a few years ago, which sort of led to the initial um, discussion of Holland Hill and Mill Hill needing to be built to a 504 to accommodate that type of comprehensive redistricting. But we're not going to really move forward on plans um, until we know, you know, we're, we're closer to actually doing it, being that there's so much changing in town. Um, so we're taking to some extent, not to pass the buck, some direction from, from you and from the Board of Finance and from the RTM, ultimately what size the school ends up being. We have an ed spec of 504, would have been more than happy to move forward over this past year to plan around that 504, didn't really think that's responsible, have done as much work as we possibly can to get to the point where once a decision is made, we're ready to act. Um, 
you know, we've been talking about it with the community. We've got a lot of community feedback. I'm sure you've probably heard Mr. Bateson was our moderator at our town hall. He can probably tell you a little bit some of the public comment we got about that. And um, that's really, you know, where we are. We're looking forward to the projections that we have. When you build, when you factor in the ECC, it really does bring you at 90 percent capacity for a 504 at the elementary school level. Um, you know, looking to the future. And just for the growth of this town, a lot of great things happening. We still think Fairfield is a desirable place to live. Malone and McBroon's projections show that more kids start kindergarten here than who are born here. Um, so our school districts are attracting families. And I don't see that changing. But less for argument's sake, say it does. Say everybody leaves and there's a mass exodus and everybody's leaving Fairfield and all of a sudden, we don't have enough sections at some of our smaller schools like Dwight, you know, I'm a Dwight family, it pains me to say this, but if you want the option down the line of possibly either closing an elementary school due to enrollment or repurposing an elementary school for an ECC or, you know, don't even want to go down flooding, mold, having to close it for other reasons, it would be nice to have that flexible space, as Dr. Jones says, in one of our current buildings. Um, and I think by putting, you have, this is our last opportunity. Our other, Jennings and Dwight are due for renovations, but not for an expansion. So this is our last bite at the apple. For the million dollars between the 441 and the 504, to me it really seems um, like the fiscally responsible and smart thing to do. Um, I think a couple of you years ago thought the same way about the 504. Um, so I'm gonna channel that person from a couple of years ago, and hopefully you'll vote in favor of it tonight. So that's my um, <laughs> my pitch for now. Um, oh, well, let me just go back to the, uh, needing to close the school. Melona McBroon did do some work um, last year when we were kind of doing um, the, we had an ad hoc committee for operational effectiveness. They did run the numbers for closing Dwight and closing Jennings and what it would mean. You wouldn't be able to do that in Nels Holland Hill and Mill Hill were a 504. So if you want to plan for the best, the 504, you want to plan for the worst, the 504. Uh, thank you. Are there <laughs> any um, deadlines from external sources that uh, the state have any deadlines that we have to answer them by with plans for any type of redistricting? No. No, we don't have a deadline, for, I mean, for... Well, for the racial imbalance plan, we we have not heard back from them. We were kind of expecting maybe to hear from them this spring, um, but they have not called us back on that. We have been following the plan just in terms of moving forward on a, on a redistricting. We looked at a magnet school, you know, various other options, and we're at the point now in our current racial imbalance plan that redistricting is the next step. All right, thank you. Any further questions from the board? I have two. Um, one, you said earlier that uh, you're essentially trying to tackle a 300 student problem with the ECC. Like you're looking for a facility to handle 300 students. Look long term right now. So, and, and my question to that is, you know, why not look to just cover the overflow students and, and continue to do what you're doing where you, you put them in, in elementary schools with their space? Um, well, that's the direction the board is going. We had a decision between a short-term and a long-term plan. We thought the long-term plan would just be to utilize the space that we currently have in our buildings. Um, and one of the nice, well, one of the easier things about preschool classrooms is that we can choose where to put the children as opposed to trying to maintain neighborhood schools where you just, you know, the kids are where the school is. So you can kind of move it around. Right. Right, so where there's space and there's yeah, an extra so, which classroom. Is where we, which is where we are. Um, do that. And the other thing you said, which um, I, I was sort of surprised by, why, why did you rule Oldfield out? Just FEMA, it, would, it needs to be raised, there's asbestos. It, the, the cost to bring it up to code was, was prohibitive. And it's not big enough. What? It's not big enough. And it's not big enough, and the senior center is there, and you know, we did not really feel that it was but there's a preschool there already. There is, but it was not large. It was not large enough to house. Yeah, but you're thinking about it as in terms of a 300 student problem. If you were to, you know, do two classrooms there, you could cover 60 plus students. 
Well, for for preschool, it's not. It's 15, you know, under under 20 in a classroom, um, and there are. You would just need to do renovations. It would not house all 300. And rather than going through the expense of renovating that building that wasn't up to code, we would just put it into the space that we had in our in our current elementary schools, where their staff was there already in place to, to service the program. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for the update on the projections. Um, that moves us on to item 15, the Mill Hill Elementary School Building Committee. This also requires Board of Finance and RTM approval to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Mill Hill Elementary School Building Committee. Well, if we could resolve that the bond resolution entitled a resolution appropriating uh, to the moment this is blank, we'll fill that in with our motion. For the costs associated with the renovation and expansion of Mill Hill Elementary School and authorizing the issuance of bonds to finance such appropriation, B and hereby is approved. Further resolved that the first selectman B and hereby is authorized to execute on behalf of the town such documents as may be necessary to effectuate the resolution. Thank you guys. May I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second? Second. All right, that item is now before us. I turn it over to the building committee. Thank you, sir. You guys want to take a seat so we'll start this? Sure. Okay. I'm not sure we need the overheads. You have all the things in the agenda back up that was uh, presenting that he has on the screen. What we've done is answered, number one, the questions that uh, from the last meeting. Uh, impact of the parent drop-offs uh, and pickups, the traffic impact, as well as resource rooms, uh, serving lines, and, well, and then you just heard the enrollment projections. Um, if you go through this, want to do this? <laughs> we just want to go through this time yeah. with the paper? Okay, because we had a PowerPoint, yeah, we'll, we'll just go through it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we, again, we first wanted to address the questions from the last meeting. Uh, we'll, uh, first one was the question of the impact of the, the parent drop-off um, going from the 378 to the 504 uh, for that. Um, Tom, I'm, I'm going to plug this in. Give me one yeah. second. Here from Mike, why don't you come up? <clears throat> Mike. Okay. Let's talk to the impact of the parent drop off, Mike. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, Good evening, Mike Galante, Frederick Clark Associates. We prepared the traffic study for Mill Hill School. We analyzed three different levels of, of enrollment at the school, projected out to the future, and I'll keep it simple as far as not, not too many numbers, but focusing on the, the level of activity as far as the, uh, the student uh, drop-off, pickup at the end of the day, staff, parents, school buses, and so on. One of the key roles in any school project is safety. It doesn't matter, it, you know, moving traffic is important, but safety comes first. We separate school buses from parents, and that's what we've done in the plan. We add sidewalks, crosswalks, make it safer. In the parent drop-off area, which is off of Mill Hill Terrace today, uh, it accommodates about 50 cars at max if you take every spot within that parking area, aisle and so on, and, and the drop-off. You go back out to the main driveway, you cross the school buses coming in. We've elimin lim lim eliminated that by making a cul-de-sac out of it in a way bring that parent drop-off traffic back towards the fields, if you will, the ball fields, and bring it back out to Mill Hill Terrace. By doing that, we've expanded the parking area, the, the perpendicular parking spaces stay. There's a drive aisle that stacks cars. You have a circle where you can drop off and pick up. That's controlled by the staff. You have another aisle of parking and a sidewalk extension on the Mill Hill Terrace side of that area. And we have anywhere from 85 to 90 spaces in total 
on a, on, you know, counting every space, to be honest, to accommodate that need. And one of the purposes of that was, one, to take the cars off of Mill Hill Terrace as a safety concern. There's, you know, on rainy days, there's backup potentially on Mill Hill Terrace. From a safety concern, we brought it into the campus itself. And all the different, here you go, here's a picture. If, every different level of, of a student enrollment, we try to do that. And the results uh, from the traffic perspective, if I can go into that a little bit, what is the impact on local roads? The, every road can accommodate the additional traffic. The volume of traffic around the school is really school traffic. It's not much non-school traffic during those peaks in the morning as far as arrival and, dis and the departure at the end of the day dismissal. The biggest increase in delay, if you go to the maximum of 504 students, is at the exit drive coming out uh, by, the, by the parking lot, by the ball fields right there in the morning, which has the higher volume of traffic like any school. The morning traffic is always higher at a school. It's lower in the afternoon. After school activities, kids walk, kids carpool, go to someone's house. The volume goes down. Staff doesn't leave at 3.30. They're there a little bit later. So the volumes are typically lower. That's the only place that has an increase in delay, but it's on the driveway. And we can accommodate on the, that on the driveway because we've extended the drop-off area, the circular driveway, the aisles and parking and so on. Uh, we improved the circulation and safety by dead-ending that, quite frankly, with the yeah. cul-de-sac and cutting it off to the main driveway and keep that for school buses and staff. So that's kind of a big picture, but a lot of analyses have gone into that. And then those, there was a concern with the higher enrollment, what does that do? And between the 440 and the 504 enrollment numbers, from a traffic perspective, there's not much of a difference. Yes, there's more traffic, without a doubt. But if you look at why is it not much of a difference, we're adding 20 cars to the drop-off area in the morning with the additional enrollment. So that, that's 20 cars coming in to drop off. So we've kind of focused on that, and this plan accommodates all levels of enrollment. We looked at the maximum enrollment to develop this plan, not just me, but the team. I think also importantly, we have very few walkers in this school. Okay, extremely few. And the buses that we do have are operating at 50% capacity. So there's, there's room on current buses, and there's nobody walking. So we're really focusing on taking care of the, the drop-offs sure. and pickups. Okay. okay, for the moment? Yep. Okay. Good for the moment. I won't go first. Yeah, yeah, Mike, you're probably coming up. So I think that, that kind of addresses the parent drop-off pickup. Yep. Um, I think we talked about the local roads. We'll just hit on that real quickly. We just did a quick map. Uh, the, the, the level of service, we were talking about the level of service at the last meeting, and we're talking going from a B to a C. Um, we just basically extracted the, the intersections that were studied. These, these four were the major ones in the study. Mm -hmm. And, Mike, I think this was the one that says the Mill Hill Terrace and, and Mill Hill Road, Road intersection. Just, yeah. just directly adjacent. That's the one I think that. Yeah. Delay. Just quickly, in traffic engineering, we deal with levels of service. A is great, just like in school. F is failure. When you go home, you're in trouble. Traffic is just more delay. The letters, are, as you go down the alphabet, it's more delay, and that's how we measure it in very simple terms. But between the, the 440 and the 504, as far as measured delay, uh, there's a change in the level of service from, from B to C, but the change in delay is only about two seconds per vehicle. So there's very little change in measured delay. Now, I will say any school has a 20-minute short-term traffic congestion, yes. without a doubt. But we try to accommodate that through more of a safety perspective as far as how it operates. I'd rather have the car wait a little bit longer and have a safer condition, and that's what we did here. And one of the sheets that we'll get to in a minute talks about all the mitigation that we're doing. We're not widening roads. We're not adding lanes. We're not doing that. Uh, but we're looking at safety, no, no street parking, certain times of the day, uh, tightening up the driveway, the main driveway, to have less pavement so you slow traffic down, controlling and putting a crosswalk in with the appropriate signs. And actually, this graphic is actually a little bit outdated. But on Mill Hill Road, for example, along the school frontage, we have no parking in front of the school from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But you can, on the school yeah. side, but you can park there if there's an, a school night activity, parent night, for example, you can park there. On the east side of Mill Hill Road, there's no parking, no standing any time. It says no parking today. No parking says you can stop and drop off. No standing says you can't stop at all. So there's a difference in the terminology of, of the signs. And there's also no U-turns. And no U-turns, which, which, which we saw, because parents do drop off on okay. Mill, Mill Hill Road. <laughs> primary concern I have on this committee is the safety of the kids, okay? I don't care whether you've got to wait another two seconds or five seconds with the car. I'm concerned to make sure all our kids are safe. And that's really where I'm at, and that's what that's we've key. got. Yeah. Uh, next. 
Yeah, so I think that um, kind of go back to the agenda uh, addresses the first three, the traffic impact, not only on the site, but the local, and then kind of working our way out to the local roads uh, and the recommendations. And I think, uh, uh, like we, there, the question was the recommendations from a pedestrian um, aspect. And, and in, in their study, uh, Mike and his team, you also took counts for pedestrians. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And it's in there. There's Extremely few. Many of the intersections had zero crossings for pedestrian um, uh, access. Uh, there were a few farther down, about six down over down the street. Very low. But extremely, extremely low. Um, there, there's going to be proposed a crosswalk here, a new sidewalk up to this intersection. But, um, I think, I think At this juncture, that. I'd like to ask uh, the selectman whether you have any further questions on traffic, parking, and so forth, or should we proceed with the rest of our presentation? I, I don't want to you know, keep going around in a circle, so to speak. Well, thank you, Mr. Quinn. I, I know it's been long to get to this point tonight, and I appreciate you hanging in there. To do I'll be here as long as it takes. <laughs> um, you know, my observations are, um, one, right now, um, and the parents I've talked to, it's, it's a current traffic nightmare coming in and out of there with the buses backed up and everything like that. And um, two, I, I'm happy to see um, it re-engineered uh, but my concern is when, you know, when you go up and you've got to turn around that, you know, in today's environment, I can picture parents still dropping off to avoid that rotary and that congestion. Down, maybe in, this area. in that area. Exactly, in that area, because once you go in that area, you know that you're committing to an extra you know, four to whatever minute, whatever you're committing to, it's not as quick as just a drop and go on the side of the street, which I know we're trying to discourage. But again, the overall question or, you know, I guess, I mean, first of all, I'm excited that we're going to renovate a school tonight. The question is whether it, it with the size of it. So, you know, you, you move to that point. That rotary getting done, I really think it is, 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 is nice, it's essential to do, it, it solves a problem we currently have today. But the parent in a rush to drop off their student who didn't put their student on the bus, because the buses are at 50% capacity, is most likely still gonna make a quick decision. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, very honestly, this is my third school. I faced this problem at Riverfield mm -hmm. and at Holland Hill. And we're facing it here now, okay? Parents have to obey the rules. Right. If there's posted signage, no U-turns, they better not make a U-turn, mm. okay? That's what our police department will do, okay? Kids' safety is primary, I... okay? If it takes another three minutes, okay, I'm sorry, but so what? I, Mr. Quinn, I agree with you. I. I... I put my kids on the bus, and I hear Riverfield is backed up on Mill Plain Road with parents trying to pull and, in. Very honestly, the cul-de-sac same for 441 as it is 504. Yeah, and it is right. And if you take a look at it, and look at Stratfield School, for example, and other schools, it's the presence of the principal and the teachers to keep the thing going. Mm -hmm. And if they do it right, and I know Kevin will make sure we're. <laughs> didn't recognize you without, yeah. without your slime, but you know, yeah. uh, you know, that's the way you keep it rolling. I understand, and, I and that's critical. Any other questions on traffic at this point? Okay, now let's talk about resource rooms. Uh, the existing resource rooms. The uh, thing that was done in last February, I guess by Malone said that uh, Mill Hill has the lowest number of small spaces and small rooms. The number was 10, and that's true. If you look at Riverfield, you look at Holland Hill, you're talking resource rooms of 16 to 17, okay, in that neighborhood. It depends on how the school is laid out. Uh, but all those resource rooms are for language, for math, for gifted, for whatever, and Mill Hill has a very few of them. And this, what we put together here, uh, make sure that all the resource rooms are there for the kids at Mill Hill. Okay. 
They're my kids, by the way. You do know that, right? So. They're mine. Yeah, it's so. like one of the questions at the last meeting was the number of resource rooms compared with all the 370 to the 504. Uh, Dr. Jones, I think, after our meeting, mentioned that uh, the, the, the numbers are the same in regards to 378 to 504, but it's the way you staff it, staff those rooms. Yeah, it's not a function of the students. It's a function of the teachers that you put in those rooms. Yes, you asked a question at the last meeting about those core spaces and the extra spaces and why you don't change the number. If we have a math specialist in a small school, that teacher still needs a room. She might be there 0.6 and then the rest of the day be at another elementary, but she still needs a space or he. Um, also, when you get to 504, you still need the space, but it's going to be a full-time person. So those in the ed spec do not change with the size. If we were going to build a building of 800, you would see it change. But with the size that we're talking about, it doesn't. Serving lines, again, that was a question that was kind of great in our last Not great. There's two serving lines. There's two serving lines in the aspect. Right? It's the aspect call for two. We've got two. You need to fund somebody to work it. Right now, you only fund for one in your budget, but you got two serving lines. It's there. So that, and I think the, the last issue, and I think it's been touched upon, is the Section enrollment, so was, and we highlight that in the agenda just to address uh, that question in the, in the last meeting. So I think I don't know if there's any further questions on those. That's that's, that's that. not part of our role, anyways. Um, you know, whether it's 504 or 441, that's your call. I'd really like you to make a decision tonight, though, because I really want to move on this project and start putting, you know, all the other necessary approvals in so we could put a spade in the ground. I'm very committed to this project. I promise you, I will stay and live through this one. Okay? Then I want to drive. However, <laughs> if you keep this up tonight, I may not. Okay? However, I'm very serious. Uh, we need to get this done. Uh, this is a great school, great kids. And uh, if you look at it in terms of the dollar outlay, okay, whether you do 441 or 504, the differences are like a million three, okay? It's not that much money on an overall basis, okay? So that's not the function. It really is, what do you want? What kind of school do you want there? i tell you the one thing I, I do ask is don't give me anything out lower than 440. I need swing space. I need to be able to move kids around so that when I'm, I'm doing one end of the school, I can move kids to the other end of the school as we're doing at Hollandale, as we did at Riverfield. So the, the bigger the number, the more swing space I get, the easier construction becomes. Right. Okay? I'm glad to answer or any of our architects that are here tonight, uh, site managers are glad to answer any questions you have. All right. Any uh, let's see, any questions at this time from the board? I'm all set. Nope. There was a question I think also on kind of cost. We've got three big numbers last time and we asked that was there a chance to break that out a little bit for us so we could see kind of how that those numbers were arrived at, I, not down to a super detailed level, but just kind of a uh, little more, a, a lower cut than what we had. I, I think, um, well, there's two. So we have our, our construction budget, which Gilbane's here, uh, Peter Adamovich was here at the last meeting, and Mark Schmoss with Gilbane, who is our construction manager. They, they did Riverfield, they also did Holland Hill, so uh, Peter has a ton of experience, uh, not only in estimating, but specifically here in Fairfield. Uh, understanding the bid numbers. So this, this we kind of saw briefly at the last meeting. I don't think by the time we got there, we didn't get to touch on it too much. But uh, you can see the numbers. It's in your packet 378, 441, 504 for the construction cost. So that's what we would expect when we go out to bid for campaign to receive and, and present to the town is a we call the GMP, the guaranteed maximum price. Uh, we just want to highlight you know, our, our furniture and equipment. Um, uh, budgets for this, and again, we're at SD, we're really pretty high level. These expenses, I think we all know, those are the architect's fees, our fees, testing labs, etc. 
Oh, you got his fee. <laughs> um, owner's contingency, um, we've been ranging in that 5 to 6 percent for most of our prizes. I think we're around 4.5 to 5 for Riverfield and maybe a little over that for Holland Hill. But um, fairly modest, not overly high. And usually we'll, we'll try to budget 7.5 to maybe 10 percent on the project. <laughs> But also, uh, like Holland Hill, I'm recommending that we keep these numbers contingency, but add another half a million dollar contingency for uh, PCPs and asbestos. That's to surprise you whenever you open a wall. And that would only be used to cover those instances. We have that on Holland Hill, and we're going to use part of it. Hmm. Okay, the rest of it gets not not budget, not spend. Uh, I'd like an opportunity to double your salary if I can, Mr. Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like you to even pay me a salary. Uh, so is there a is there a construction contingency? Yes. Well, there's yeah. the owner's contingency here. Is, yeah. You're talking the CM contingency yeah. that would be included up here. That would be in this line item here. Right. And yeah. what do you? About three percent is what we assume. Yeah. I think, in the estimates. Three percent is per contract. That's what we've been carrying in our estimates. Three percent contingency, and that's how we manage for Holland Hill, and it seems to fit for that kind of scope. Okay. The to your question on the five hundred thousand for hazardous materials, that is not in any of these numbers. No, that is not. So those numbers would have to increase in order uh, to accommodate that. That is correct. Okay. Right now, currently at Holland Hill, we're still tracking about 450,000 of that right now. That's still available. We haven't really dove into that. Honestly, too deep. We're coming up to the last summer uh, of renovations. So I think, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll probably end up spending a little over 100,000 of that. But uh, with the, with we'll the see. studies we did with the hazardous uh, consultant, Lord and Curran, doing our preliminary studies, our experience from Riverfield obviously was a uh, tremendous help in, in, in their involved with this job as well so throughout the design process we'll be doing that same process of um, doing our homework taking our sampling doing our uh, investigations and right and on the other side of the coin and some we should ask this we are getting out every pcb and asbestos we can find in these schools so you ought to know that okay we are not whitewashing we're not burying and not doing any of that Anything that's there is gone. Mr. Bateson, you had a question? He answered it. Okay. So uh, if, there, if, uh, if there's any questions on the breakdown, I, maybe by trade classes, maybe I think we might have been referring to. Uh, for that. If, uh, so this is the next one if you want to speak to this, Peter. Sorry, it's pretty much the slide that you had before, and this is the same information that we presented last time. It shows the three different options, 378, 401, and 504. So what it, it tells the story a little bit differently is we wanted to make a comparison to Holland Hill. So Holland Hill, all in, and escalated to the proper date and time equal to Mill Hill, the total project cost was $20,655,000. But in order to compare it apples to apples with Mill Hill, we had to do two things, because the sites are different, so we took up the site work. and then. We're replacing the roof over here at Mill Hill, which we didn't do at Holland Hill. So we took the two components out, which was a million seven dollar reduction. So now compare the twenty million nine hundred eighty-five thousand dollars to Holland Hill of twenty million six fifty-five. They're almost they're very comparable. They're three hundred thirty-five thousand dollars apart. So that's just a kind of a quick validation that there's parity between the school and, and, and cost between the two schools. And that's a site where premium, yeah. right? P yes. A premium. Right. Yeah. Also, you ought to know that in terms of the square foot cost, they're all within the range of about ten dollars, yeah. three forty to three fifty per square foot. Yes. Okay, so they're they're pretty pretty comparable if you look look at it in terms of a time and inflationary basis. Brick and mortar, you know, just the building itself. Mm -hmm. Like, in the all three buildings are six. Square feet, Riverfield, Holland, and Mill Hill, plus or minus 500. Either side of that. They range to, like I said, 241. What's that? Which is pretty comparable. 
What's the actual square footage difference between a 504 and a 441? Yeah. Um, so we'll start at 378 is 56,300 square feet. I know the 3,800 square feet gets you to 62,000. A 60, 62,200, that's 441. And the difference between 441 and 504 is another, um, about another 3,500 square feet. So it's 62,700 square feet. Every one of them is just about three classrooms, about 1,000 square foot per classroom. So you're talking 3,000 square foot, roughly speaking. Plus, some, and then you also have circulation. So yes. Circulation. Okay, but that's a neighborhood. Yeah, I learned something, huh? All right. All right. Any further questions? Not at this time. All right. Okay, to go to the public. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thank uh, you. Any public comment at this time? All right. I'm gonna kind of re remind or, or reissue our guidelines here. One, it's public comment as opposed to Q&A. Two, ask you to keep your comments to under two minutes. And three, for any of the speakers after the first speaker, please do your best not to repeat the initial comments. And then after that, if you just come up to the mic, uh, give us your name and address. Hi, Janine Alianello, uh, 472 Mill Hill Drive. I'll have comments in a questionary tone. Um, I have a question, a, a comment about the traffic study. Um, I was wondering about the impacts of tolls on I-95 since Mill Hill Terrace and the Post Road run parallel to that where people would come off and go around Mill Hill Terrace to get onto 95 but we'll see what happens with that. Um, also, I want the school to be a fun place. I'm so happy you're renovating it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, it should be an enjoyable, fun place. Um, and I had heard, don't have any school events because too many neighbors complain. Um, you know, is that gonna change once you get your school? But it should be a neighborhood for everyone to feel happy and safe in. Um, the reason why there's not a lot of walkers is because there's no sidewalks. If you were to watch the sidewalks on Mill Hill Terrace, Every day I go to work, I see scooters, I see kids walking, strollers, a lot of people walk. On a smidge of a sidewalk I had made, people walk on that. Kids would walk if there were sidewalks, there are none. Um, I got to see a woman get hit by a car, that was fun. Um, and then another thing, another comment is, I thought I saw a new roof get put on that school a few years ago with solar panels, so I'm confused. A new roof, is that for the whole building or the side of the building? Because if you're gonna put a new roof on, that is wasteful spending. And you know what, 1.3 extra becomes even more. How are you gonna fix the road and widen it? That's expensive, is that in your budget or is that just for on the school property? So be wise with our money and I'm supporting a 441 school and I think that would satisfy the neighbors and most families. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else from the public like to comment? I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name is Cheryl Kim. I live on 56 Taylor Place in Southport. And I wanted to share with you that um, in the summer of 2015, my husband and I made the decision to move from our little fixer upper in West Haven to Southport. Um, we nearly doubled our living expenses each month with the exclusive purpose of sending our children to Mill Hill School. The reputation that Fairfield Schools has is impeccable and we have not been disappointed in the least with um, Principal Chase and the teachers and all the dedicated um, parent volunteers. I will tell you that when we came to our orientation, um, we were very surprised when we came to the building. Um, there is absolutely nothing different about the interior of Mill Hill Elementary School from Washington Elementary in West Haven. There is nothing different about the interior. Um, we didn't concern ourselves with looks, um, but when our children started coming home in December, January, February, March, with nothing under their winter coats but their little white t-shirts, 
because it was so unbearably hot that they had to take their sweaters and their long sleeve shirts off every day. Um, we became concerned about the heating regulation in the building. Uh, it's a tremendous waste of natural resources. Um, it's also hard for the kids to focus when they're uncomfortable. Um, another concern that I had was that um, one of my children had to be on allergy meds for most of his first grade year. And when my second child went into that same room, um, we discovered that there might have been an envir environmental issue there. Um, because once those children were no longer in that room, they didn't have that series of a problem. Um, so my last comment would be as a professional, I have been working with people with autism and developmental disabilities for 25 years. And I can tell you that having more space is crucial. Um, whether or not the numbers line up for a larger school, um, having extra space is very important. If you want to de-escalate a child with sensory issues that's having a meltdown, the best thing to do is to take them out of the room of 22 kids into a quieter space. If there is no extra space to go to, you have to go to a more intrusive way of keeping people safe. And that can affect the education for the typical children as well. So that's all I wanted to say. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else would like to take advantage of public comment? Hi, Kelly Acker, South Pine Creek Road. Um, I would just want to applaud everybody who's been supporting this project and um, pushing it through to this day, um, and hopefully the other town bodies. Um, I, my sister was born in the 1960s, I was in the 70s. My sister, same high school, was overcrowded. When I got there, it wasn't as crowded. You just don't know the swing. Um, I hope you support whatever the Board of Ed has recommended. Um, for this town, and it's fiscally responsible to do. And that's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, uh, Jessica Gerber, Board of Education. I'm also the liaison to the Mill Hill Building Committee. First, I just wanted to say with the Mill Hill roof, it was a partial roof replacement um, for part of the 1991 edition and part of the APR. The roof that is in this project is the remainder. So that's just to clear that up if you had any questions about that. Um, it's certainly no secret that I support the 504. Uh, the Board of Education unanimously approved a 504. Um, I think that it is the best plan for this school and for the district. I'd also just like to point out that right now, this school with the five portables that it has, has a capacity of 483. We'll take away five, five portables and add six classrooms to make it a 504. Yes, I understand at this point, some of those portables are not being used as general education classrooms, but they would have the ability to be used as them. In addition to that, the rest of the smaller core spaces would be happening with a 378, a 441, or a 504, as was delineated in the memo that was sent to you on April 18th, 2018. So please, I hope that you support the 504, and uh, thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment? Molly Horahan, um, 645 Rowaner Hill Road. I'm a Mill Hill parent. Um, and I brought with me a Mill Hill directory from the year before my son started kindergarten from 2011 when there were uh, 23 sections, 23 classrooms of students. Um, we're talking about a 504 being a 24 classroom school. Um, the second you, um, you know, approve a 441, you're running the risk in another population cycle of having to bring in portables again on this beautiful blacktop that has been designed for the perfect size school. Um, the risk of putting special education and other enrichment programs out of the classrooms, back onto the stage, back into the hallways as it was at this time. Um, and I think it's um, remarkable work and we've had such um, support from the um, Board of Ed and the, and the Building Committee to try to get um, parents informed. Um, however, there's been some misinformation regarding uh, transportation and traffic, and I think it's just an undersell to, to, um, to imagine that that cul-de-sac won't 
seriously alleviate the traffic problem. Um, it's got parking on both sides. It's a two-lane uh, road, uh, you know, driveway, and um, and I and parents won't even have to get out of their cars to pick up. It's just it's a no-brainer, um, and it's so it's so insignificant. I can't even imagine it would be 20 cars because we don't all because students do bus. It's not even at the capacity. So I think it would be really unfortunate to go with a 441. Um, with overcrowded neighboring schools and schools in flood zones um, that are already over capacity and suddenly be stuck with portables on this beautiful, well-designed new property. All right, thank you. Any other member of the public that would like to comment at this time? Good evening, Norm Roberts, South Pine Creek Road. I'm also on the Mill Hill Building Committee. Uh, I don't have any allegiance to any size school, but I, I have some children there, and I think that um, we need to do the project. So whatever needs to be done to get it happening, the, the facility is suboptimal at best for the students. It gets very, very hot starting this time of year. Um, it's, there's very few classrooms that have air conditioning, and uh, it would be a better experience for the students to uh, have a renovated better facility. So I'll leave it up to you all and the Board of Education, Finance, and all the powers that be as to what size the project should be, but I would implore you to make sure that there's a project. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Hi, my name is Danielle Stupak, um, uh, Southgate Lane. Um, I am a parent at Mill Hill along with at Ludlow. My second child's about to finish Mill Hill. By the time this is all done, most of my, my last one will be most of the way through. So I speak also as um, a professional, as an occupational therapist. Currently, we house our OT and PT department on the stage of our gym. So you have kids who are coming in who have sensory issues and it is the most not optimal situation. Um, two years ago, I have a kid in fifth grade now, and it's a much smaller fifth grade, but two years ago, I was, my son was in a fifth grade of 93 kids. So there's pendulum swings, ups and downs, and I wanna make sure that it's important that when you're taking all this into effect that you wanna be the most fiscally responsible. Um, I personally do support the 504, given all of that, I, that I've said, um, and I, either way, this, we do need to have this renovation. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment? Um, Bill Gerber, um, I'm on the RTM District 2, and I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, one is um, we look at target enrollment of 85 to 90 percent of capacity. I think the traffic study was done for capacity, not 80. So the traffic study for 504, if you really think about target, it's really 428 to uh, 454. And for 441, it's really a traffic study for 375 to 397. Um, if you look at target capacity of 375 to 397 for 441, um, and you look back to 2011, like another speaker mentioned, it's not just 2011. We would have been, um, we would have been over the target enrollment um, back in 2015, 16. So all the way from 2010 to uh, 2011 fiscal year through 2015, 2016, we would have been over our target enrollment in those schools. Uh, in 2016, uh, 17, we would have been over sort of the 85%, but we would have been under the 90%. So when we're, when we're looking backwards for many, many years, the 441 would have been inadequate um, for target. The point on enrollment and projections um, and how accurate they can be recently, 
I would just like to comment on, you know, just in any financial services sort of world, you have what we call black swans, and you've sort of got your run of the mill, sort of year on year, what you expect, but, you know, then things happen. And so I think we've been in a relatively simple, to, you know, easy environment to project recently. I, I don't really um, agree with the idea of looking forward and putting a lot of, you know, faith in those looking forward numbers because things happen. When we closed our schools, four schools in, in 1981, including Oldfield, Mill Hill was one of them, uh, Grassmere, we, we closed that and gave, gave that away for another purpose as well, um, and Osborne Hill. I'm sure at the time, the selectmen, you know, at that time thought there's no way we were ever going to recover from, from that. We're, we were in a, an economic downturn. I, so I would caution um, placing too much faith in the going forward projections that are based on sort of run rates. Another point is I think, I just want to clarify some, something because I have spent way too much time on this, I think. Um, but the traffic study, I didn't see in the report any degradation between the 441 and 504 in service level. So if you could just clarify, well, I, I'm not allowed to ask questions, but I don't believe there's any degradation. I think the degradation came from 378 to 441. And I also spent way too much time. I actually went up and observed pickups and drop-offs and um, in that, you know, at, at the school. And I think the traffic concerns that have been mentioned are, are way overblown. Um, they're, they're at pickup at the end of the day, which I was told was, you know, uh, drop-off, I mean, I should say. Um, the, the spaces, no, no one parked and walked their kids to the front. They all waited in line. And the line only went, the line did not stretch back to the road. So I'm a little unclear where these concerns came from. It may be like the worst day of the year, maybe the worst storm of the year or something like that, but they're really nothing compared to what we see at Osborne Hill basically every day on Stilson Road. So I, I don't think, unless you have gone and observed it, I don't think it's, it's really fair to sort of judge the traffic there based on what someone may have texted you about because I don't see it in, in reality. Um, and I think that's really, I mean, it's not, it's not ideal, it's not great, but you know, they've changed the configuration, so it's gonna be better. So I think those are, oh, the other point is the 1.16 million differential, just keep in mind that we should be thinking about 80% of that, which is 930,000 between the 504 and 441 because we have a 26% reimbursement and I guess some things aren't reimbursed, but so net, we usually get, um, on this kind of stuff, we usually get 20% uh, back from the state, so it's, it's under a million. Thank you. Thank you. Would any other member of the public like to comment? Jill Vergara, um, I'm a representative for District 7. Um, I support a 504 for Mill Hill. Um, I, I think that the Board of Education selected the appropriate size. They're capable of planning, and I think that we've been asking them to do some long-term planning. And if we don't uh, go with the ad spec that they uh, elected, then we're hamstringing them from doing any sort of real long-term planning. I think Dr. Jones phrased it very well when she said, um, it depends on whether you want to do an eight-year plan or a 20, 30, 40-year plan. I think a smart way of approaching town development, town planning is going the 30, 40, 50-year route. Um, and I think that it would be really short-sighted to look at projections for the next eight years and make a decision to go with a 441. It's the prototypical penny-wise and pound-foolish for me. Um, the other issues that Dr. Jones raised that I thought were really um, important to think about um, is a sort of contingency plan for us. When we see other districts around us dealing with mold issues, this is a very real concern. Because we can't put AC in our schools immediately, we're going to be kind of 
flirting with a, a disaster like some of these other, other towns are dealing with. And I think that we have to make sure that we provide any necessary space that we might need. Um, and we do have a school in a flood zone. So uh, there, are, there are two reasons why you need some kind of contingency plan. Um, I'd also like to note that there are several RTM members here tonight. I haven't seen this many RTM members at a Board of Selectmen meeting in very long. I think that there's five of us here and I think that that speaks to the fact that this is ver a very important project for the entire town and um, we're, we're supportive of 504. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public like to comment? I, as a member of the public? Yes, you can, Mr. Quinn. Thank you. Tom Quinn. I live on Myra Street in Fairfield and I have worked on Riverfield and I'm currently on Holland Hill. And 504 seemed to have worked in both of those schools in terms of being able to get the construction done on an efficient, effective basis. Given the fact of the ECC uh, changes in, in terms of enrollment and placement, uh, I could see now where 504 would make more sense for this school also. So I urge you to go 504, but do it tonight, please. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to comment? Please come up to the mic. Heather Dean, uh, Stilson Road in Fairfield, 919 Stilson Road in Fairfield. I also want to agree with uh, Representative Vigar and, and her comments, what she had to say. Um, I, I didn't realize the ECC had been growing quite as much as it had been, and uh, I learned that this evening. And I can tell you as a um, early childhood care provider that I'm seeing more and more children who do need services who are getting recognized that needing services more. So they are here and they are receiving services and they're, and the parents are far more educated and they understand that. And so that just is going to lead to needing more seats in more schools down the road. Also, um, I'm an empty nester now. I'm still in town. My, my daughter graduated last year. I can tell you that at Osborne Hill School, when it first reopened in 96, 97, uh, it, we had 263 kids. It's, it's unbelievable to think of how much it's grown since then. Our population really hasn't changed all that much since my husband was born um, in town, yet we still are having more and more children come and still attending our schools, and our schools have an incredible reputation. I know that our families uh, come here specifically for Fairfield schools. But the real reason why I came up here, I, I'm thinking about the expansion, the difference between the 504 and the 441, and I'm, it, it brings me back to a story that my husband had shared with me when his parents had expanded their home on Mill Plain Road, and at the time, um, very sweetly, they had, they kind of doubled the, the size of their home, but their particular bedroom, they they switched their sleeping arrangements from having a double bed to two single beds. Now, it just was convenient for them, not realizing that they didn't really account for those two extra feet that they needed. And even though they spent all that money on the house expansion, their bedroom was just not really prepared to have two single beds in, and it was really uncomfortable for them. Now, you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with this story, right? Well, th this is what I'm telling you. Let's not be penny wise and pound foolish and, and, and think this through. And if it's going to be a smaller cost to increase to 504 and it's going to be able to accommodate a whole lot for this town and for the families and the children and, and the usefulness of this school, then I say let's go for it and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public would like to comment? Okay, seeing none, it's back to the board. Uh, any further comments from the board? And just uh, to kind of lay the ground rules, what I thought uh, makes sense. We have a motion before us with a blank number. I'm going to suggest that perhaps one of the first motions we make is to amend it to put it in the dollar amount, then we vote on the amended motion. Okay. That seems like a reasonable approach. Uh, with that, uh, open any comments from the board. So I have a lot, I have a lot running through my head right now. Um, I heard an awful lot today. 
uh, which I wasn't prepared to hear. One of the things I did hear today, which was new to me and, and new to um, Mrs. Dean, was the ECC um, projections. And um, uh, I'm looking at, I have a couple things running through my mind. I'm looking at the projection numbers. Uh, I'm looking at, at this map with the, the yellow dots, yellow circles, blue circles, red circles. Uh, I have that going through. I have uh, a lot of thoughts. I'm actually wondering if, I, if, if we could do a, a recess, if we could, a five minute recess. I, I also know that we're in discussion of possibly having a, um, a special meeting next Wednesday. Um, the yeah. um, you can you can certainly request a recess and and I just want to uh, make one comment, uh, but we can certainly proceed with that. Um, what I wanted to say is is this has been a very long meeting. It's nine nine fifteen. Um, it started somewhere around five o'clock. I want to thank uh, everybody who's still here. Uh, I want to thank the audience, the public, the board of ed, um, our presenters, our superintendent. Uh, uh, you've, you've been very patient in going through all this and this was luck of the draw that I think there's a full moon out so that we've, we've had a number of shorter Board of Selectmen meetings recently and we're paying the price tonight. So I, I, uh, it wasn't planned to do this but I do thank you for or sitting with us. Uh, if the board wishes a pause, we can take that. Either way. All right, let's, yeah. can we, five minutes enough? No, uh, yeah. All right, if we can do a five minute pause, that would be good. Uh, the item is back for discussion at the um, Board of Selectmen. Is there any other further discussion? Yes, and I have an amendment to make too. Okay. Um, you know, thank you for your patience, everybody who's here tonight. Uh, I think it was good for me to get out there and, and clear my head and sort of digest what I've heard tonight. Uh, you know, what I heard tonight was new. What, I mean, realistically, we didn't hear any of this two weeks ago. I didn't hear about the ECC. Uh, it hasn't been part of the narrative. It has not been part of the discussion. It certainly wasn't part of the ed specs. So what I'm basically being told tonight is new information about adding potential swing space in the future. We heard about new enrollment numbers for ECC. We didn't really um, hit upon during the budget session as well. So uh, to me, that, that creates you know, a new narrative which is being driven towards towards you know an uncertain area and that uncertain area is trying to increase a need to sell something which I don't think the focus should be on that tonight I think the focus should be on the fact that we're going to be voting on renovating a school which desperately needs a renovation we're going to be voting on uh, you know new lockers new cafeteria uh, new HVAC, uh, HVAC system. We are going to be voting on very late for a Board of Select meeting, but regardless, we are going to be voting on it. Um, uh, we're going to be voting on something which has been in the pipeline for, for, for many years. And, um, you know, I take the comments. I did do dil due diligence there. I did do a tour. Um, I have been there for pickups and drop-offs. Uh, I have talked to a lot of parents. Uh, one of the complaints I always come back to, and I've talked about at the Board of Selectmen meeting many times, is you know the fact that you have you know events at night, and those events at night, whether it's you know a concert or you know whatever gatherings we have, and the principal spoke to it last time, you know you're splitting those nights in half right now because you can't fit it. You know you don't have sidewalks there. There's no sidewalks there. The lighting is poor. So when we're talking about what we currently have there, and we're looking at this population chart, which was given up to us tonight, and we take into account the McClone and McBroom recommendations of years ago where, you know, they swing the students around, okay? That's not what I want to talk about tonight, but that's been on the table for many years and it hasn't happened. It simply hasn't happened. We're talking about renovating a building today where, uh, and I guess the, the big discussion is is the 504 versus the 441, and that's certainly what I view um, right now. I lean towards the 441, 
And I do that from the standpoint of um, the actual site of the school, I don't believe can really accommodate a 504 and continue to, to do what we want to do there. We want to have a nice neighborhood school. We want to have, um, we want to have a fun place. When we're talking about adding extra classrooms to the blacktop space, we're talking about reducing an area of which the kids would be using for, um, you know, recess or whatever. Once those portables are out of there, you're going to have a, you know, beautiful spot for the kids to run around um, during recess. Uh, we we are talking about, uh, like I said, a renovation which is long overdue, and um, the. I believe the 441 has the best chance of passing the fastest through all the town boards. And uh, this building committee has come in front of the Board of Selectmen many, many times. And uh, you know, I'm prepared to make an amendment to uh, fulfill fill in the numbers for uh, the 441 plus the $500,000 for the remediation money. I can do that. So, are you going to make that motion? Yes, I am going to make the motion. I just got to get to the number page. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to fill in the sentence resolved that the bond resolution entitled resolution appropriating blank be changed to 21 million. If you want to add in the five, it would be 22 million six hundred. Yeah, 22 million six. And six hundred dollars. And six hundred dollars. So making a resolution to, to change the total amount to twenty two million six hundred dollars. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. uh, any further discussion on the board? Yeah. Um, first of all, Chris, I think you did a good job summarizing all that. I've I've struggled with this project for a long time now and have become very familiar with what goes on at Mill Hill. The, the community, what what I seem to think they want. Um, years ago, I, I was a strong proponent of the 504 model for the BOE. Uh, I stuck with that on Holland Hill. There comes a time where I'm starting to see numbers go down. And to Chris's point, there are other programs out there that might use this space, but that's not, I, I can't chase that without knowing where we're going. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's what, I mean, I was kind of hoping maybe we'd get some resolution from BOE last night. I mean, we have racial imbalance, we have redistricting, now we have ECC. What's before me is building general classrooms. And I just, those are the numbers I'm at right now, 441. I, I just, you know, the facility itself, the neighborhood, going beyond that, I just, I can't see it at this time. That's all I got. All right, all right I see some of the difficulty, and, and certainly uh, we've been through this for the past year, and certainly the last uh, couple weeks. Um, I don't support the 441. I'm looking at the 504, and I'm, I'm from, there were a number of issues. Uh, my first concern was can 504 fit on this site, given the topography, given the ledge, and, and the building committee established that it could. Uh, my second concern was about traffic and safety. Uh, and I asked a, uh, probably a few more questions than, than the building committee would have appreciated at our last meeting about that. But that was a very deep concern, and, and I appreciate coming back with some of the answers here today. I am concerned about the redistricting, the racial imbalance, the ECC, again, which is, is some of the new information coming out, it would be nice and simpler if we had a clear, concise direction and plan that we knew we were building this into. Uh, but we don't. Uh, however, we all know those things exist. We all know we need some flexibility. We all know these, these things are out there. Um, uh, and what we're talking about is a 5% difference. Uh, and for me, that 5%, once you eliminate the safety issue, um, then it becomes uh, a financial issue and a fiscal responsibility, what I'm saying, for 5% more today, and that 5% gets spread out over 20 years, um, that gives us the flexibility 
of addressing racial imbalance, redistricting, and ECC. And the, the Board of Ed doesn't have a definitive plan at the moment. But if we can give them the resources, perhaps we can get a better plan out of that. So the question is, thinking long term for the town, what's in the best interest of the town? Um, I wish it was easier for us. I wish there was something in front of all three of us that, that we done, but we don't. Uh, but we can't ignore the fact that, that those other kids uh, or our students uh, need to be put someplace. And we need to provide the seats and the capability for that. So I won't be supporting this number as much as, uh, you know, we certainly need a renovation at Mill Hill and, and uh, that's going through, uh, as we've said, probably for the last 12 months, it's a question of, not a question of whether we're gonna renovate Mill Hill, just a question of what size we're gonna do it at. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, to address both the knowns, but also importantly the unknowns, uh, that a million dollars spread over 20 years is about $50,000 a year uh, on a $320 million budget. Um, I think that buys the, our students the flexibility they need uh, to do that. So with that, uh, unless there's more comments from the board, I'm about to go to the public for comment. Uh, All right. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, you and I can debate your comments versus my comments all night long. Yeah. You can go back and forth. I don't know if I can make it all night, Chris. Yeah, no, I know. I, I don't know that I can either. You know, I look, I look at the population projections from McLone and McBroom, and, uh, you know, the closest it comes to a 441 is 80 students away. And I know that's not the 90% number, mm -hmm. but that's still flexibility space in the school to move around. And, and I, I get it. We can do this. We can do this. Those spaces exist throughout the town. And what, what you highlighted is what we've been asking the Board of Education to address for, for you know, the racial imbalance is 10 years old. The overcrowding at Sherman is, is 10 years old. And it, you know, it, hasn't, it hasn't had, and we've had the opportunities to do that along the way. So, you know, can, continue to do that. And, and listen, there's added costs throughout the, the course of the year with building a bigger school. But, you know, the, big, the bigger school on that property, the way it's laid out, you add more students and you take away, you know, a little extra fun space here and there. And I, I don't see the students coming based upon the projections. So. Yeah, and I think that's, a, that's really the challenge of this one, is that if you looked at just Mill Hill alone, you looked at just that neighborhood, uh, just that community, uh, perhaps um, we wouldn't have to look at something like this. But I think the, the issue is we have to look at the district. We don't have to. We can look at the district and look at the district-wide needs, and that's what's driving me to the other point. If I look at just the projections for the Mill Hill community, I wouldn't necessarily uh, argue with the points you just made. But from a larger sense, and I think that's what we have to look at, is, is district-wide, what do we need? How do we provide the flexibility for our students and the space they need uh, so that they're not crammed in at Sherman, so they're not crammed in someplace else, so that we have the flexibility on, on doing that, 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 um, you know, that, that we address the ECC need in space. And once you start uh, moving those numbers around, um, I think the extra capacity, uh, again, for the cost, is a good value. Right. That's all. And, and, and this map, which we were handed today, is, I believe, what is the roadmap to, to addressing what, what you're doing, what you're talking about right now. It's laid out. There's, there's spaces. If the board does what they claim they're going to do, the opportunity to do that exists with the projections we have throughout town. So. At, at the risk of going back and forth, yeah. since you didn't want to do that, uh, I, I think if you look at the other map <laughs> that lays it out much more clearly, Chris, you will see that um, when they start to factor in those projections, that is exactly the issue that uh, they come to. I will, so I'll, I think that, I will call um, it truce with you on that. <laughs> All right. Any uh, further comments before we go to the public? All right. We're going back to the public. Uh, guideline is same as before. Uh, please come, please stay under two minutes. Um, please try not to repeat what's been said. However, one other guideline. Uh, this is an opportunity to address the amendment and the amendment only. Um, it does kind of address what the project is about, so you, you, you get a lot of flexibility on that. Um, 
but um, if there's new information to come up or a new perspective, that would certainly, that would help us, that would certainly be beneficial. Mr. Quinn. I came into this project yesterday, as early as this morning, saying 441 would do it. After hearing about ACC and factoring in, yeah, 10 years of overcrowding, okay, and other schools, and nobody's ever taken care of it, it's still overcrowded. And again tonight, we're walking away from it. That doesn't make any sense to me, okay? You know we have overcrowded. That's right. We know we have ECC problems. We can't continue to walk away from it. And it's not a function of fun in Blacktown. The kids have enough places to have fun there. I resent that highly. Okay? That school will be fun. Okay? <laughs> and it has nothing to do with Blacktown. Yeah. There was a redistricting plan in the racial imbalance plan, which the Board of Education could have said, this is the plan that we are going to put forward, that town bodies have looked at, no one was coming, knew that in order for the plan to be put forth, the school had to be a 504. That information was shared last year, and for the past year, we have been in a holding pattern primarily because we don't know if it's going to be a 504, or a 378, or a 441, or another another size. So we have been trying to do as much work as we possibly can in order to be ready to move when a decision is made. As far as the overcrowding at Sherman, this town values neighborhood schools. The Strategic Planning Committee says we don't want to put our kids on long, long bus rides. Um, concerned about class sizes. Where are we going to put Sherman's kids? Riverfield was getting renovated. The minute Riverfield was done, you know, we saw that neighborhood just explode. Um, there wasn't space for kids from Sherman. We're not going to bus kids from Sherman up to Dwight. Holland Hill was in the midst of a renovation. There wasn't space for them there. So they have been waiting. And thankfully, we are in the trough right now that kids are not in portables as in, at many schools as they used to be. But, you know, it's forward thinking. Um, you know, Sherman's waited. Now we're, we have the opportunity to expand at a school that is in their feeder pattern on the west side of town, and it just, it, it just seems to be very short-sighted not to support the 504 at this point. In terms of the fun, they have a beautiful playground at Mill Hill, probably one of the best playgrounds at all the elementary schools in town. Um, so I agree with Mr. Quinn. I think that school is fun now. It'll be fun with a 441. It'll be fun with a 504. Um, the fun comes from the kids and the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public want to comment? I'm going to ask you to hold your applause. We don't really do that around here. Uh, it's not our custom, and I don't want to discourage anybody who might have an opinion that's different than the majority in this room. I just had three quick things, Tony Jones, school superintendent. Um, first of all, Jeff Peterson, who is a you know born and raised in Fairfield, and one of our board members sent you an email yesterday. I know you are incredibly busy. You get a ton of email. I don't want to assume um, that you are able to read all of your email for tonight, but I want to make a couple of points. He did some great research about what's happening in Connecticut. Um, according to U.S. Census data, Fairfield County is the only one of Connecticut's eight counties to gain population in the 2010 to 18 period, rising 2.8%. Um, the Connecticut State Data Center is showing that between, between 2015 and 2040, Fairfield, our Fairfield, not the county, is expected to see a population increase of 13.1 percent. This is the second highest pace of any Fairfield County town. He also researched the University of Connecticut forecast suggests that Fairfield will see an explosion in youth population, including a 92.56 percent rise in children between the ages of zero to four by 2040. Next year is 2020. We're talking about a 20 year and again we're talking about a long term plan and I will give you a copy of the email just in again out of respect I know you may not have been able to read it. Um, the other thing I just want to point out is that um, during the budget season I present the budget in January this was a slide in the budget about the growth of ECC. The chart that you have is exactly the same chart that's in the budget book on page 7. 
So it, it's not new information, but again, out of respect, I know you have a lot of departments. Um, you listen to a lot. This has been, I think if you talk to the school community, a huge discussion for us all year long, but we did make every attempt during the budget to make sure that we are informing people, but I think sometimes you have to hear it several times before people really realize what we're dealing with at our Board of Ed meetings because we're also busy dealing with our individual areas. Um, the other thing I would say is that before before Mr. Collin left, who was over our facilities, you know, I wanted to double check that I still knew the current pricing for a trailer. I call them a trailer because that's what they are. They're not safe. We don't want them. We're trying to get rid of them. Um, if we are faced with overcrowding issues, and right now ECC is a real issue. It is a real issue. $350,000 a trailer. We will pay more for three trailers than what we can pay for these three classrooms for 50 years. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment? Please, come on up. Hi, Michelle DiMartino, Patrick Drive. Um, I just want to make comment about South Pine Creek. I'm not sure if you've driven up and down South Pine Creek, but every single Cape House has become a big, huge house. And we're going to do a renovation on our school and make it a very desirable school. And a lot of people love the South Pine area. I'm one of them. And we're going to get a whole bunch more kids in our town, in our, in our uh, small area here. And all those kids are going to go to Mill Hill. And we need to be able to accommodate for them. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment? Kelly Acker, South Pine Creek Road. Um, I also want to address the blacktop uh, comment that you made. Um, it is my understanding that there is no difference between a 441 and a 504 for blacktop space for our students. Um, also, my kids enjoy the beautiful huge playground that we have in addition to the blacktop space. Um, and I just want to reinforce to the portables. Please be fiscally responsible because if you have to add unsafe portables at 350,000 to 400,000 a pop, think about that for the long term. Think about the future. Think about our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment? Bill Gerber, RTM District 2. Um, I just want to make it 100% clear. I think it's fiscally responsible to give up three classrooms that are part of a school that are going to cost $930,000. Um, a portable, fully installed, typically costs us two to three hundred thousand dollars, and those are shorter lived and not as safe. Um, I'm, I'm wondering where the fiscal responsibility is, is factoring into this leaning of two of our Board of Selectmen members. Um, it's certainly not coming from a fiscal responsibility standpoint. I don't think you can make that case. Um, the safety case has not been made. So I'm not sure what the case is. Um, and it flies in, t in the face of what some very prominent, what, what I had to sit through and listen to, some very prominent Republican <laughs> members uh, um, said emphatically about the importance of 504 schools, not, not sort of half-heartedly, but emphatically. It's a matter of record. So I, I simply do not understand this about face. I, I would like an explanation that's not sort of tap dancing if it's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment? Hi, Jen Jacobson. I'm not going to reiterate all of the points that other people have already made um, because you already know what they are. So I'm going to make another point to you. Your experts in this room have told you what is needed. Your superintendent, your construction team, your board of ed, our numbers, the building committee, and the public. We're supposed to be working together. We're supposed to collaborate. I'm on the phone with our delegation on the state while I'm in this room. I'm texting with them. We're working together for this town. 
Everyone in this room has told you that this is what is needed, and you are going to drive our kids back into portables. A long time ago, a bad decision was made, and we are digging out of that hole still with the portables. Your decision tonight will be enshrined the same as that if you do not move forward with what everyone here is telling you is needed. You are wrong. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment? All right, seeing none, it's back to the board. Uh, the amendment is before us. Any further comments? Yeah, I'm just going to follow up. I. I don't see this as short-sighted. Uh, the numbers that I'm looking at and going out until 2020, or 2028 or whatever it is, I, it doesn't bring me to the 504. And people are sitting here telling me that kids are going to be in portables. I don't see that number. I just don't. So I haven't been convinced to go to the 504 based upon that narrative. Yeah, I think at some point, if you look at just the school, uh, certainly there's support for that position. I think if you look at the broader issue, that's what it raises the question. If you look at the across the school district and what's taking place from that standpoint, I think is where that point comes from. But I have nothing further. No, I'm good. All right. Then, uh, all in favor of the amendment as proposed, uh, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I am. Uh, I think that covers it. The item is amended. Um, and now it comes for us to vote on the amended resolution. Um, and I think we've had discussion on this before. So we did the amendment, so it's now just back to this. Yep, yep. So all in favor of the resolution as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed? I am. Um, it, the amended resolution passes two to one. All right, thank you all for waiting through all this. I'll give everybody a moment here. Yeah. yeah. our audience. <laughs> All right, just while they're doing that, um, Where's the I added this item uh, number 16 oh, here um, to see if the board wanted to take a formal position on the pension cost transfer. It's something I've been trying to encourage other towns around here to do, and I thought it might be helpful for us to discuss it and consider it. Yeah, I, I'm happy to discuss it uh, and uh, I'm happy to have a conversation with about other initiatives I think I think the board should take right now especially being the fact that uh, I watch what the state's doing right now and them looking towards you know special session to resolve a whole bunch of these issues which are on the table so not only do I think um, we should take a formal position in opposing the transfer cost for the teacher retirement system I, I would talk to you about other things I think like I said in the budget session, we should do everything we can, fight tooth and nail to avoid um, having to pay this uh, and, and get our points out. Uh, it is unfair that the state uh, mismanaged this money and they're passing it on to the, uh, the towns to, to cover their mismanagement. So I, I would support that. Okay. With your permission, let me put this um, 
read this up so we can get it first and second so we can have it on the table before us. Um, to here consider and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the first selectman, resolve that the town of Fairfield is opposed to any transfer of costs and obligations for the state teacher pension, uh, state teacher retirement system. Um, I have a motion to accept. I'll make a motion. A second? Second. All right, so that's before us. Uh, certainly, it, this is the draft, we can edit it. I didn't mean to, um, I think wanted to keep it simple. fairly simple and, and what I was hoping um, as I've reached out to other first selectman mayors and encouraged them to do something through their council or board of selectmen along the same lines. So hopefully we get enough towns doing this. We're sending a message to Hartford that uh, all the towns oppose this. Yeah, and like I said, I think there's other things I would, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about after this meeting. Okay. Um, any further discussion or any yeah, no, I'm, I'm, modification I'm, to this one? I'm happy to join in on this and send a joint, is this gonna be a joint resolution for the board? This is now gonna be the board's position, correct? Correct, and what uh, with your, um, my thought would be that uh, we would send this off to um, other towns to let them know what we did and yeah. encourage them to do the same uh, and send this off to the um, State. I guess our state delegation, so yep. they can they can use it as appropriate. I would request that it comes with three signature lines for all three board of selectmen, not just one. Uh, that I will sign. Yep. Happy to do that. Okay. And I also feel like for those of you at home, we've already taken this position. We took it twice already, oh. uh, but now we're formally like, hey, here it is, directly in the mail to them versus what we've said at public meetings. And I think there's no question that we took that as a board and that was the, the tone and tenor of all of our comments. I'm looking at it, the uh, budget season coming to an end. Mm -hmm. What I'm worried about, uh, as has happened in the past, is the state budget that last weekend, six people get in a room and they bring things back from the dead and put them in the budget. And I just wanna make sure that this is not one of those things that comes back from the dead and gets put into the budget. So you could make the argument that it's not really there now and, and we, we could feel good about that. I, I'm just, until they vote, I'm not gonna feel good about it. That's yeah. all. I understand, so yeah, I yeah. All right, if that's the case, we're done talking. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, okay. all right, thank you. We might get done by 10 o'clock. Uh, tax collector, to here consider and act upon tax refunds as recommended by the tax collector in the amount of $34,806.68. May I have a motion to accept? I will make a motion. A second? Second. All right. Uh, any edits? I've confirmed the number is accurate. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. May I have a motion to adjourn? Before we adjourn. Go right ahead. Uh, I just want to wish everybody at home a happy Memorial Day. Uh, I think this is the beginning of the best period of time in the town of Fairfield. Uh, you know, everything's green, everything's bright. We've got the parade coming up, the Memorial Mass at sea. If you haven't been to that as a, as a town resident, I believe that's Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, I certainly look forward to seeing everybody at the parade along the parade route on Monday. Um, and. As of now, the weather looks good, right? <laughs> I'll keep my fingers crossed. And certainly, uh, under the possibility that anybody actually is out there listening at, after five hours of Board of Select meeting, I would concur with all of your comments. Look forward to seeing everybody at the parade. Mr. Bateson. I can't wait for a parade. All right. We'll see you all there Monday morning. Bye for now. Uh, motion to adjourn? Motion made. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 We're done. Thank you. Oh, thanks.